Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 334 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Friday. Thank God I'm Fly Day. <laughs> March 8th, 2024. And actually, well, we're also celebrating other people who are really fly. Yes. It's International Women's Day. Hell yeah. And as we all know, Canadian girls kick ass. Yes, they do. <laughs> Well, I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Of course, a big, big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health this day? You know, sir, my mental health, um, despite my physical health being off because of this bronchial infection that just continues to drag my butt down. My, my mental health has been great. Um, I will say that the addition of an 80 pound, um, American bulldog slash Dogo Argentino, uh, has certainly contributed to it because, uh, puppy dogs always make you feel better no matter what. Right. They always lift you up. So it's like, she'll just come over and just snuggle with me when, I don't know, it's, they're able to tune into the fact that you're not doing well yes. and will do their utmost to make you feel better because that's just, we don't deserve them. Like, you know, that saying, we don't deserve dogs. Mm -hmm. I feel that in my bones. So yeah, mentally I'm doing great. Um, you sound good too. Physically. Uh, yeah, my, my, I'm doing considerably better. I'm probably at about 70% today, maybe, maybe a little below that, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to yeah. push myself. Uh, I had an opportunity. We had uh, um, offers. Uh, well, well, you know what? I'll just the, the Ray girl uh, texted me last night and said, "Listen, um, I have to head out of town on Saturday morning early. We have a very early flight, and I have tickets for Seth Meyers at the NEC at nine thirty on Friday. Mm. Would you and Bridget like them?" And I was like, "I really would, but unfortunately, I'm just I'm not well enough to attend something like that." Yeah. I don't want to make it worse. I'm trying to get better as quickly as possible. So I'm really isolating, which is difficult because it's Friday and I'm not going to the pub today. Ooh, you know? okay. Yeah. Well, and I talked to, I said, I'm not even going to the pub on Friday. She goes, Oh, you, you aren't feeling well. I'm like, no. And I don't want to get my friends sick. I don't want to get any of the staff at the pub sick. I just, I'm just trying to get better as quickly as possible so I can get back on with my life. You know, this isn't something that's going to drag on for six months. This is like a week or so, sometimes two weeks. Hopefully it won't be that long. But yeah, so unfortunately I can't attend the show tonight. But uh, I'll have to check with the rig girl and found out if she if she had anybody that could take the tickets because she doesn't want them to go to waste. Mm, yeah, understandably. Exactly. So yeah, so thanks to the rig girl who made such a kind and generous offer. I just, I literally, I got to stay home tonight, unfortunately. So 
I'm, I'm almost there. Hopefully, uh, hopefully by Monday, I'll be back, back in the saddle, but we'll see. We'll see. Play it by ear from, from between now and then. <clears throat> and yourself, how are you doing? Uh, I am doing uh, much better. I think this, I, I think I might, might be fully back. Okay. I That's think good. I might be fully back. I'm just good. Uh, the time, maybe just a tiny little bit of congestion left, but I think I might be fully back. So, I mean, um, the, I don't know why it is like the last few days are just sort of like slowly lingering. Um, but I'm not, uh, I mean, yesterday I had a, an extremely productive day. Let's put it that way. Oh, that's great. And I haven't had one of those in <laughs> two weeks and a half. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like just cracking stuff out by noon and going, holy crap. I'm feeling, feeling fit. And beer's yeah. back. <laughs> type thing. Nice. Uh, and uh, last night, uh, Alex, well, my beaver sweetie and I uh, went to go see uh, the play version of um, uh, As You Like It that uh, I, I was producing for a local community theater. And um, we have ourselves a hit. Outstanding. It Outstanding. is visually stunning. Okay. The costumes are fantastic. The light design is exceptional. Like when you, you know, sometimes you go see plays and you know, whatever, and the certain things stand out. The lighting design in this one is really phenomenal. And they've got recorded a whole bunch of different music in the back. It's, it's, it's a play, but it's pretty darn cinematic in a way. So um, I was, I've never seen anything done that way in our theater that looked that good. So um, I'm hoping that uh, you know the two uh, there were some reviewers there yesterday. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they liked it as much as I did because hopefully I'm not too biased. <laughs> but it really is. I mean, we we do some pretty good work at that theater because um, you know we have a carpentry house in inside, and you know the, it's a good board that does a lot to keep on you know improving the theater. We, we put sound stuff on the walls to help carry because the, it was a little echoey in there so that the voice carried, we were able to understand everything. It's one of the reasons why we had stopped doing Shakespeare because a lot of people basically, if you were in the back row, really couldn't understand it. You know, you have to be kind of clear. So, um, but yeah, this is, this one, it, it, it looked like it was an entire different theater. Like we had like a whole bunch of gadgets and stuff that I didn't know that we had. <laughs> so, um, yeah, very, very, very good work. I can't wait to see what the reviews say. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. keep us posted. <laughs> I'm eager to uh, eager to learn what they have to say. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to let you take it here from here because uh, you've arranged for our guests. Yes. Yeah, so today, uh, because it is, as I said, as we said, International Women's Day. I didn't. I didn't say it. You said it. We said it. Mm -hmm. We're all saying it because it is International Women's Day. We have uh, um, a guest today who's going to join us for a little bit. I don't know what her time schedule allows, so she'll give us a few minutes. She is a woman. Sorry, I've got Lola's here wanting attention. <laughs> my talk. Um, we have a woman of uh, international stature on the international stage when it comes to uh, Canadians representing Canada. She uh, is, well, pretty kick-ass. So I'll just introduce her. We'll bring her in. We'll have a nice chat with her. Ladies and gentlemen, kids and cubs, fans of sports, put your paws up. As Mr. Beaver always says, please, sir, go ahead. And give us a big round of a pause. For Lorraine Ostigui. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> bonjour, bonjour. Ça va bien? Ça va très bien, oui. Uh, C'est un plaisir. It's such a joy to have you. Thank you so much for coming to the Beaver Lodge. Well, thank you for the invite. Ah, now before very we sweet do, of you guys. <laughs> now before we do anything, I always ask Mr. Grizzly before we start our show, how his mental health is doing today? So, Lorraine, how is your mental health doing today? My mental health is doing great. Excellent. Sometimes, sometimes it's challenging, <laughs> but uh, we just continue on our way and and try to, you know, putz along, as we say. It's uh, I own a business, so that's very yeah. challenging. Yes, <laughs> I'm learning. And, and tell us, tell us a little bit more about this business that you own, um, because I think a lot of the uh, 
viewers and listeners would be interested to find out some of the background and some of the history that you have when it comes to representing or helping Canada represent on the international stage. And you can obviously describe it much better than I ever could. Well, it's it's something that grows out of a, a practice of a sport that is just part of your youth uh, mm-hmm. every morning and then becomes something a bit more intense uh, with uh, the hours of implication, the training. I was never really interested in um, competing, but I wanted to play hockey initially when I was six. Uh, my brother was playing hockey. He's two years older than I am. So he had that option for a leisure sport to practice with the city right. organization. And I wanted to play hockey, but it wasn't allowed because <laughs> I was a girl. <laughs> mm-hmm. Those were the restrictions. I'm in my late 50s, so that could give you an idea. 55. What, yeah, I'm 59, actually. So 59. It, it was... <laughs> It was something that wasn't allowed. No, it wasn't. There were a lot of restrictions for women on, on what you were allowed to practice and what you were allowed to do. So um, my mother, I either had the choice of going into ballet or do figure skating. Those were the two activities that were given to me as a choice. So I took figure skating because at least it was a bit more dynamic. And I continued uh, from... 1970 to 1984, where uh, I continued figure skating. I became an accomplished figure skater, but I never liked competition. I I really didn't like the atmosphere. It was a it's a judge sport, so it's kind of like uh, not always the people who win deserve to win. Yeah, especially and, when we especially back in the days when we were on just the 6.0 system. Yeah, yeah, it was it was ten n'importe quoi là, des Wait, fois. It was, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was really not great. So, but I I, I persisted in being um, an accomplished figure skater, and what happened is this: when throughout um, the whole process of skating and training, I started teaching the young skaters at ten, and I started teaching hockey players. Uh, the techniques of skating, not just um, getting in shape. It, that wasn't the key uh, interest that I had. It's to te- teach them better technique to skate. So what happened is that eventually going from age 12, I started giving courses to hockey players and it okay. never stopped from there. So bringing all the techniques that I learned in figure skating onto an ice surface for hockey players um, was pretty much an easy process and is pretty much an easy process for any figure skater because figure skating has invented any, every possibility uh, thing that could be done on an ice surface. Uh, Figure skating is right now an extreme sport. Yeah. And they've invented everything that can be done with a pair of blades attached to a skater that can be done on a nice surface. So mm-hmm. bringing all these basic skills to hockey uh, was an easy thing for me. So I started teaching and teaching more. And then slowly you went up from local to a bit more competitive level. And um, I basically uh, started teaching uh, higher level hockey, um, wound up, giving courses, uh, being hired by hockey agencies. So we're talking about uh, junior major, American League. I had a couple of NHLers also uh, to try to better their techniques on the ice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it brought me to um, working with the uh, Olympic women's hockey team, uh, the second Olympic hockey team that uh, was... uh, Integrated that had integrated women's hockey. So Nagano was the first one in 98. Mm -hmm. I worked with a couple of players from Nagano locally that I I got the pleasure to work with and better their skating techniques. And then in uh, 2002, we had a Quebec uh, coach and I knew her personally. 
and she knew what I was capable of. And then she, she hired me to go and better the skating skills for the 202 Women Olympic hockey team. That was an interesting experience. Um, going all around, I went to Calgary, then I went to Quebec. Um, they were based a bit all over the place training. Mm-hmm. So I followed them uh, through a year and a half of preparation for the Olympics. And it was a very, very nice and interesting experience, actually. So, it was in Salt Lake City, wasn't it? Oh, two. Yeah, Salt yeah. Lake City. It was the um, the most incredible hockey match yeah. <laughs> the final ever. Uh-huh. Yeah, where the Olympic, uh, the women's team really played almost half the game, four against five. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes three against five. And there was like, oh my God, uh, how nerve wracking it was watching that in in my living room. (laughs) It's uh, anyway, if anybody hasn't watched that match, uh, it's something very uplifting uplifting to look at. Yes. Yes. So that, that <laughs> was a very uh, good experience. And from then on, when I came back, I was asked to work with a whole lot of uh, levels. I worked with Midget AAA. Um, and then I went to work with agencies. And it's kind of something, and parallel to all this, well, I straight out of university, actually, not even quietly finished university, um, I had started a business. Um, that specializes in selling skates, sharpening skates, and all the technical stuff. Because in figure skating, we were lacking stores and very knowledgeable stores. That was mm-hmm. a key issue. So combined with, uh, I'm very handy. <laughs> I'm very, very handy. So for me, fixing stuff uh, that, and it, it comes just so easily uh, to me. So. When you sell figure skates, you're selling boots and blades separately. You got to mount them yep. on. You got to do the sharpening. And with figure skaters, um, very the type particular of level right? of yes. perfection that not very much can really affect their skating skills. So that is the key point where that we were missing with all the stores. Like a lot of places couldn't sharpen well, and a lot of places couldn't yeah. mount blades on boots to save, to, to save their life. So yeah. um, all those the sharp, skills. The sharpening is different as well for figure skates, right? Because you have no, to be able, it's, is it? it's not that it's different. It's just that you cannot warp the blade out of its original shape. Mm. So, like with hockey sharpenings, when you would go to the pro shop, they would eat both ends of the blades. And after like two years, you would be skating on a banana, mm-hmm. which is, you know, balance point. But a figure skating blade is not like a hockey blade. So you have a presence of the front pick that allows us to do all the crazy stuff we do on the ice. But when you sharpen the blade, you have to sharpen it evenly throughout every sharpening. So after a year or year and a half um if you warp the blade gradually out of its original shape and you shift the rocker off center gotcha technical elements are very hard to execute Mm -hmm. they become very hard to execute it's very precise right you have to keep the integrity of the rocker on a figure skating blade so you know what would happen if you would go to the pro shop or any store then the the young a clerk that's there decides, oh, this pick is such a cumbersome thing. They just take it off and they yes. don't ask you. And yes. then your blade is shot. Yeah. And yes. then you have no more blade. And you have to change blades because you can't bring something you took off. You can't yeah. glue Once a pick gone. back on. It's you know? gone, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that that was a, um, something that was uh, lacking. And when we started the business and then we started sharpening, uh, it just kind of blew up uh, and grew so, so big, so fast. So I've had this business for 37 years. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very challenging uh, thing to have a business and employees and, and keep the level of quality of service and t- to up to the reputation. So mm-hmm. that's the most challenging part of the business. Yeah. Anyway, so throughout that, while well, I continued running the business and giving courses, uh, okay. which is time-wise, you can imagine what the implication of time yeah. consists of. Uh, 
And it brought me after that, when I came back, um, figure skating called me back, which I taught figure skating also right. from 84 to 94 throughout the whole process of having my business. And then when I came back from the Olympics, uh, my Olympic experience teaching that level, um, I was called back to figure skating. So Synchro called me. And oh. <laughs> synchronized skating uh, yeah. is something yes. uh, yeah, it's very, very entertaining. I think this uh, side of the sport, I hope, is going to become Olympic one year. Soon, I hope, they've been set aside and put aside so many times throughout the last six Olympics. Um, I hope it's going to become a, an Olympic sport. But I worked with the, um, the now uh, world champions, Les Supremes de Saint-Léonard uh, in mm -hmm, Saint-Léonard. Mm -hmm. Montreal. There is a big club for synchronized skating with very many levels for beginning up to national team champions. <laughs> they're, they're the Canadian champions and they've been world champions twice in a row. And they're going for their third title uh, this year uh, in April. So that will be very interesting to watch. Um, but I've was brought back to uh, work with figure skating in 2007. And it's been something I've been working. So the last time I was on the ice with them is the summer 2022. Mm. That was a bit difficult throughout the COVID um, to get, uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of restrictions and only the coaches uh, were, the direct coaches were on the ice with the skaters and everything. So. But it's, it's been a very nice experience, and I'm very happy to see where the sport is uh, going. And uh, they've had, actually, Worlds at, uh, in Ontario um, two years ago. Okay. It was, yeah. For Synchro. And, see, I didn't know that because it, it doesn't get the focus or the spotlight that either pairs or ice dancing gets, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately no. because I, I, I've seen it a couple of times. And I'm like, okay, that's... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very impressive to see it live. It's even more impressive because TV doesn't render the actual speed with which skaters right. are, are going on the ice or flowing on the ice. Right. And because the shots it, it are so is, wide to get everyone. Yeah. And that's the cue as the camera can't give us many times uh, a good enough perspective of, of that part of the, even the choreography, it's hard to follow sometimes. But um, that is that is definitely like they uh, they're pretty much uh, the biggest club right now, and they're sustaining the passion for that sport. These clubs, these local clubs, thank God to their passion because the sport within um, the whole structure I don't think has been considered seriously enough. So I'm talking about Skate Canada, and I'm talking about the ISU. Um, Let's say what it is. They're they're not really considering that sport. They haven't, you know, given it enough of consideration. Right. Now they're kind of I don't know if they're forced to because it's getting to the point of popularity that uh, maybe is going to force them to have to make the step. But there's a lot of issues bringing the sport into the Olympic venue of disciplines. Um, the first thing is the quantity of skaters that have that are going to show up at the Olympics will right. change substantially. If, mm -hmm. if you look at Winter Olympics, they're all mostly individual sports. Right. Yeah, it's true. If you look at Summer Olympics, then you got handball, volleyball, soccer. You got like teams, teams, basketball. Everything is Field huge. Hockey. But right. in the winter sports, if you look uh, uh, skiing, uh, it's pretty much all individual sports except mm. for hockey yeah. like, and hockey curling, curling is the next team sport yep. for four people. Yep. Um, so bringing that discipline in uh, would be a considerable logistic. Uh, yeah, adjustment. because there's 16 people on the ice at any given time. And I'm guessing there are still other people that come in case someone gets injured or something, right? In, yeah. Most team. teams are 20. Yeah. And then you have the coaching staff and all the support, like, they don't have as much as hockey because hockey has the therapist, physical therapist, mm -hmm. right. le, 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 massa, le massage, 
uh, you have and all the rest of the stuff um, they don't have that part they have mostly the person who's taking care which is the manager then the, the coaching staff then the girls are are 20 so you'd be looking at least uh, 24 people per team oh wow okay yeah and then there's also some countries shouldn't be allowed to go because their level of competitiveness is not up to par where our local <laughs> junior teams would you know beat them completely would beat them yeah that's uh the spend the saint leonard yeah that's i think that's nexus yeah it's it's really a hard sport and um the hardest part of it all is the capability to skate exactly the same in synchronized movements and all the structures that they do at high speed and the elements are hard also mm -hmm. but it's a beautiful sport and i think they've only blocked it because they don't want to have to have like 400 more people too. Well, yeah, and, and just the, the timeline, because I mean, th the amount of time dedicated to people on the ice, in addition to all the other skating events, the men's single, yeah. the women's single, the, the pairs, the, the team the competition, dance, the team, it's like you're going to have to add almost another week of competition just to make it happen. Either so. that or add another rink. <laughs> and, well, in the yeah. yeah, but the if you look at the thing, the things that are being done, um, instead of allowing a new discipline into the Olympic uh, structure, they are adding disciplines like in short track. How mm -hmm. many more disciplines do we need in short track? Like, I don't want to downsize short track. I, I, I know a lot of <laughs> athletes yeah. that that's their sport, but it's just like, okay, it's the, the, you know, this race, that race, uh, double race, four race, uh, four race, five key Ks, uh, you know, it's, it's like swimming. They're adding different disciplines, yeah. but instead of like, you're just the same thing for figure skating, they added the team event. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't, I don't find it's a good thing because you're asking athletes to leave their best performance on a team event and they're repeating exactly what they did there yes. on their personal uh, right. competitive event. Yeah, because so it's the same routines. Just, it's, you're just seeing them skate twice. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the thing, you know? <laughs> For me, yeah. that is, um, it's been their effort to add disciplines, but it, it I prefer to see synchro mm -hmm. and to be managed a bit better, but to manage the, 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 let's say the, the teams that arrive in the last positions could be, um, beaten by our novice teams. Mm -hmm. That's how not advanced they are, but they right. should restrict it to a certain level of Olympic performance. Like they do in athletic, uh, disciplines. Like if you don't, uh, pole shoot a certain distance, you can't show up and, mm -hmm. Uh, so at, minimum at qualifications, worlds. right? Yeah, that's it. So yeah. that that is something I find that that could be managed to limit a bit the access to uh, to the Olympic event. And it always been an issue to justify: Are they really Olympic level athletes? Mm. They are. That was it the, because they're not doing quads and triples on the ice, and technically they're not, you know. Yeah, so, but it's different skills, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, when you're doing all the totally, transitions and totally. cutting, I mean, it's, and then, then the proximity yeah. to each other, it's, it's you know, it's easy to have a slip. It's easy to, um, oh, if something do. goes wrong, to end up cutting somebody else with your blade. It's easy And to they do. have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, so, it, it's like, if I was to describe what happens on the ice, it happened many times during practices. We have girls on platter lifts. They're being held up by three other skaters and in some level of difficulties. Now they're only being held by two to get mm. better GOEs, which uh, great of execution for, yeah. for better points. Well, 
you get one girl that just has uh, her pick hit the ice or her blade hits the ice. And if you have one of those pillars fall down, you can imagine what the platter lift happens to. And I've seen a girl go from six feet five platter lift down to the ice <laughs> and no time flat. And, yep. and, and I've, ice I've, is hard. I've, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had some skaters slash their arms. Yep. One girl had a heel go into her mouth, mm. a yep. heel of a figure skate go into yep. her mouth. And or just straight out collisions on on like line straight crossings. out collisions and concussions. Yes, is the other lots problem. of concussions. A lot yeah. of concussions. Figure skaters don't wear helmets, but they practice with helmets and synchro. But you can't really jump with helmets. It's yeah, it's so you learn how to fall essentially. But when you're mm. 16 on the ice, you can't predict what's going to happen. Well, it's, al it's almost like the, the Peloton in cycling. When one bike goes down, they often they have a whole bunch <laughs> yeah. of other ones, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that, that the little domino image effect, I, the pile right. up. Yeah, right. I, yeah. I'm glad you're talking about that because that little visual I was showing, I'm actually rehearsing for a musical, and one of the people in the musical's daughter, I think daughter or, or niece, or not, is competing and they just we just had the nationals like this so that was uh starlight Inter starlight international their intermediate team who yeah, had won gold yeah. and they gone gone unbeaten all season so that was a if in case youtube like this that's actually somebody's personal video <laughs> I, I didn't take any copyright <laughs> so it was just uh, yeah it was it, it's quite a coincidence because that like yeah. that just happened that was like from february 25th yeah and, here and, you are. and yeah, this this sport is allowing a lot of um, uh, skaters to come out of the woodwork because there's adult uh, level uh, synchro, mm -hmm. and it's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. So. And boys I, are allowed now as well. Huh? I've seen, boys are allowed now too. I've seen a couple of, over the, in the last yes, couple of years, yes. a couple of synchro there competitions. Are, sometimes where there's like there's one boy in the sixteen, but. The yeah, boys are allowed now. Yeah, there's no restriction. There's far less boys to choose from in figure yes. skating, but though it physically, this sport is the, the men are really bringing it up to another level because they have the physical attributes for the level of technical skills and physical skills required to pop quads. And it's something else. And uh, the world's next worlds are being held in Montreal. Yes. And um, very soon that, that doesn't happen often. I think it last time we had worlds in Montreal was seven, 75 years ago. Oh, Ooh. wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's how far back. So this is really, uh, it was supposed to be in, uh, in 2020, but COVID took care of the rest. Yes. Uh, so now it was uh, delayed to uh, this year. And um, anyways, that is something if, if somebody wants to go see an event and see the height and the level of uh, acrobatic skills these these men are <laughs> doing uh, live. Yeah, I think we, yeah. we have a, we, we're now having at least in singles we're having some men who are doing full routines where all their jumps are quads or, or have a quad in the combination. Yeah, and um, the impossible is being achieved um, five rotations. Yes. So I don't, I don't think physically it's possible to, to, to do more than five, uh, not physically, but in the physics of things. Yes. The level of time uh, that you're off the ice on a take, take off for a jump. The maximum you can do is, is five rotations. So you can't. So that, that's where they're going, which is insane. <laughs> it's See, literally I, insane. I worry about five rotations. I mean, four was already a concern, but like if you only had one or two in your program, that's fine. But the I, I have a dance background and the level of torque that you have to put on your body to be able to go that the, as fast as you need to get four or five revolutions yeah. and based on how high you're able to jump. And, you know, the longer a program goes on, the less high you're able to jump. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, if you've got a four-minute or four minute routine and you've got seven jumping passes and every one of them there's a quad, either a single or a double, if you're starting to add quints, I mean, at some point, some people are going to be like, actually, like, be torqued because everybody always rotates to one side specifically as well. There's a few people that can maybe rotate both sides and you get, like, more points if you can do that. But most people... Just, you know, have a dominant side when they jump and they they spin. Like well, even yeah, uh, even as dancers, you know, when we start doing those 
long series of pirouettes, pirouettes that yeah. just keep going. Most of us prefer to go in one direction rather than another. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it just. Well, it's like being you're going to pull a lot right of hand, it, it, right. it has the same impact where it's already difficult technically to learn everything that you can do on an ice surface. Uh, you won't have that much time to to learn how to do it the other way. Yeah, so, that's why I'm worried, like for people's bodies, because at some point you, you you must be pulling yourself out of alignment from having to well, jump that hard. That's that's really another issue that a lot of people are not discussing. And it's been something that I've been discussing a lot of times with a lot of my clients that are like I have clients, uh, Olympic level, world level skaters uh, that cater out of my store. And it's it's in this world that we know we don't get any feedback and no studies are being done, actually, with athletes to see all the body uh, problems they have after the career. Yeah. But uh, the number one on the list, which is really ridiculous, um, the uh, level or quantity of people under 40 having complete hip replacements. Yep. Okay. Yep. Like it's getting to be alarming. And um, I've always questioned that you know, the gratification you give for athletes in their programs for all the uh, technical skills that are equivalent to what is needed to be part of the Cirque du Soleil there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, this level of contortion and all this, uh, it, it gets to me uh, to be at the level of really analyzing the implication of giving a lot of points to the Billman spin, the layback mm. spin, yep. the donut spin, where you're basically asking somebody to bend in a complete different oh, way. Oh, yeah. And for if you gratify it, then everybody has to do it. Right. So point-wise, you're creating this precedence. Right. Uh, the same way they create a precedent that made no sense to me, which is jumping with your arms over your head. Yes. Physically, like my father's a, a mechanical engineer. Okay. So he's, he's telling, why are they giving more points to people that are jumping with their hands over their head? It's a lot easier to rotate than keeping your arms at, at, at your waist level. It, it, it just makes the rotation faster. So physically it's actually easier, but it took them a while to, to get to understand this, but mm -hmm. he never understood that. And I didn't either. So it's just like, and it's not that beautiful aesthetically either, but mm. the precedent, you do that, you give more points, everybody's doing it because yeah. they want the points. So the point and, and the success you can get out of, uh, let's say, doing these uh, skills that are ding du soleil, what the impacts are physically because uh, back problems, hip problems, uh, and they're pretty intense. Uh, some national skaters and world level skaters uh, already have two hip replacements. I know a couple and they're, they're in their forties. Mm -hmm. So uh, figure skating is hard on the body. Nobody wants to speak about it. It's such a beautiful sport, but those are the implications. Yeah. Cause when you're talking about the hands over the head, I remember like when I first noticed it, it was Brian Botano, the famous, you know, Botano Lutz when he would mm -hmm. do it, but there would be like one in the program. And I think it was not too long ago, there was a Russian skater, Alina Zagatova, well, all her jumps in the second half of her program, every single one of them had the yeah. arm go above, uh, had the arms go above yeah. the head. So that's like, you know, again, once in a program as an artistic flair, but now it's sort of like everybody's yeah, doing it. And I, I, I remember like there was a period of time for which um, the, um, uh, when they're doing the spiral step sequence and then they pull their leg up into the Beelman, like doing yeah. it on one side and then doing it on the, on the other side. And it's like every single person, like for about a period of like five or six years was adding that in that program somewhere yeah. in the middle or near the end. And it's just like, yeah, like, when, yeah, you're right. So when you get all the programs start to look alike at, at a certain point, yeah, it becomes generic. To, yeah. There are a bunch of, it becomes generic performances because the allocation of, uh, gratification through the point system basically creates generic programs. And at one point it, it started to become a bit boring to watch. Yep. 
um, because it was just the same thing, copy, paste, copy, paste. And, and there was a lack also that I find of artistic, uh, distinguish yourself artistically. Yes. Um, that for me was the, the joyous uh, times of Toller Cranston. Um, you know, the, the people yep. that really changed the sport creatively. And, and Philip Candeloro. Some... Huh? Philip Candeloro. Oui, Philip. Yes. And, you know, those are, those are the things uh, that made figure skating like uh, iconic. Um, Tor Volendine is yes. another one. And, you know, today the dance is also rendered very generic. Yeah. So what differentiates your performance from another one is left entirely to the choreography. <laughs> and then the choreography became very important, yeah. very important. You know, it's between everybody was doing the skill. So the only thing that could really make the small difference was, was that. So mm. anyways, that, that's, uh, and as, as for uh, hockey, well, I'm very proud to see where, you know the girls are at this uh, at this moment yes. being their national uh, hockey league, yes. and finally have a bit of something that's going to take off. And it's beautiful hockey; it is very yes. entertaining hockey. And I would love to see this. I'm sorry, it might be insulting. This type of intensity in the National Hockey League, and they play hockey, and it's very interesting. I've had a lot of clients. Uh, tell me that, oh my God, like they, they can't believe the level first. And even yep. if it's not, you know, NHL uh, six foot two uh, players on the ice, the, the caliber of game oh, yeah. is, is yeah, response to a lot of people or a lot of fans that really like, because it's really good hockey. Exactly. If you like yeah. actually good hockey, because it's, it's not slow. It is fast. There is contact. There is different rules, but uh, yeah. the, the women were asked specifically what they wanted to do with contact, right? So it's like no open hits in the middle of the ice and stuff like that. But yeah. there's it, it's physical for those who like the physicality. It is physical, but it's almost like there's it's like back in the days when it was NHL hockey and then men's Olympic hockey because it was on a slightly bigger rink mm -hmm. and you couldn't you know, do some of the things that you could do. So people are, and plus, you know, when the NHLers started going, the hockey team owners didn't want their NHLers, you know, their billion dollar investments to get hurt. So there was a whole lot less checking and a whole lot less, you know, trying to take people out mid ice and actual hockey. Yeah. You know, and everybody's going, Oh my God, why can't NHL hockey be like that? And they started to move that way. But when you get to the women's game, because you have, Fewer, you can have a team in, in men's hockey of everybody over six foot two, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much easily, and not so for the women. So, you know, you have a bigger variety of body types and sizes. You know, you'll have some Amazons, but you'll have some people who are real mighty mouses who can really skate yeah. and deke yeah. and get around you. Yeah. And, you know, By just, it was a very short yeah. player, and she really was feisty on there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but we're right. seeing a bit the mentality change because I've seen hockey go through a lot of stuff, like even men's hockey, mm -hmm. um, being in contact with uh, a lot of people in the hockey industry. Like I've, I've done some some level of uh, clients that are very interesting. So, you know, when you look at what the uh, the men's hockey has been focused on is always size, size, size. Right. And, you know, then slowly uh, we're going towards, you know, speed and skill and right. which we find like uh, people like Suzuki that don't have the six foot seven build or, but yeah. they still manage to play and they actually make it a very interesting game to watch. Mm -hmm. So the mentality is starting to get like, it's nice size, 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 but at one point game, 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 you know, yeah. Right you have to balance things out and, and it would be interesting to see, like uh, there's a lot of young or smaller players that are not able to get into the, uh, uh, the league yeah. because they want big players still a bit too much and yeah. don't focus enough on the, the product is basically 
the entertainment that the game gives you and yep. the the speed the, that's the show and yep. sometimes focusing on size uh, can give you a different show yeah it's almost like for certain sports you you need to wait weight classes <laughs> for hockey <laughs> hockey for people who weigh 75 kilograms and less if you were because <laughs> like it, rowing's the same yeah. way right everybody's six foot three there's like men's rowing is uh, and huge it's like this and i'm thinking okay well you know i'm five foot six what if i want to row well i'm never going to make an olympic team yeah it would be ever. like the featherweights yeah. the, in boxing you got level weight levels and you could separate the the skills but it's anyways, it's interesting. And what I find personally uh, most entertaining junior major uh, hockey level skating, um, like the, the games I've been involved uh, with teaching one of uh, uh, um, one of the hockey players uh, that played for Les Remparts avec uh, Patrick Roy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very interested in watching throughout the season what was happening with that team. And uh, they just played marvelous hockey, like incredible hockey. They're always 120% invested. Um, and the intensity, the, the level of game, the quality of game junior major for me is, was a very nice show last year. Uh, well, they mm -hmm. actually Rampart won, uh, the Memorial cup. They that was the Quebec the, city team, right? Yeah, Rampart, yeah. Patrick Roy was the yeah. uh, coach. The coach. And, um, they did the trifecta which is, you know, I don't think we boast enough about it because they won uh, the, pres the President's Cup. Yep. Um, so they won their, their year. They f finished first for their, in their, div in, in their, yeah, in their junior division. Major. Yeah. They won the President's Cup and then they won the Memorial Cup. So they won, they did the trifecta. They finished okay. first and they won and they won. So uh, what, that team has accomplished and the level of game that uh, was, uh, I think junior major was really, really uh, great hockey to watch last year. And hopefully mm -hmm. it'll be again this year for some teams <laughs> to get to the Memorial cup. But that for me, um, sometimes it's, it's a nicer show than even the NHL can offer. Mm -hmm. I think that the players are playing too many games, uh, yeah. NHL and if uh, you look at it, uh, they're physically, uh, how can they sustain that? I think physically they, they, they should have less games because if you get, if you go through up to the series, uh, you got 82 games and, and you're up to 102 games. If you finish something mm -hmm. crazy like that, if you go to the end to the Stanley mm -hmm. cup finals, yeah, I don't, I don't see any other sport playing as many uh, games as they do and it's very physical. So I find mm -hmm. that they should reduce the, the amounts of games and cater to having better hockey and not just playing games for playing games and filling up the stands and filling up the back pocket and not focusing enough on, on maybe offering a better show mm -hmm. now, and taking you, care of their athletes in the process. Yeah. So when, when, so when you're, um, Teaching, I'm guessing that when you were talking about teaching the skating skills to everyone, you're to, you were talking about taking, like, for example, figure skaters, you know, the cross cut is super important when they're coming up yeah. to build up the speed to go into those jumps. And so is it taking the, the skills and the power that goes into that and to try to transfer it to hockey? Well, it's, if you're comparing figure skating to hockey, there's no difference. Okay. Okay. Like technically. Mm-hmm. You're into a gliding sport. A gliding sport is short track, figure skating, hockey, and the other gliding sport, cross country, mm -hmm. skiing. It's yep. different gliding because you're yep. just playing with gravity with uh, alpine skiing. But technically, a gliding sport, uh, there's no difference. If you want to create speed, it's the same techniques. Okay. And... The only thing you don't cross cut when you're country, cross country skiing. So, right. So, but if you're just pushing to gain speed and you're doing a skating skiing, not yeah. cross country. Uh, not the classic. Well, yeah. classic, the skating. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same dynamics, but 
for a hockey blade or a figure skating blade, the cross gets a cross cut. There's okay. no difference between both. Mm -hmm. Like to tell you the truth, um, I'm a figure skater. I've been on figure skates pretty much all my life, but then I stopped teaching in 94 because I had the store was going crazy. I couldn't do it physically and I didn't have enough time. So I just kept the power skating. And okay. what happened is just, I never put my figure skates back on. So when I was working with Synchro, I was in my hockey skates. Gotcha. I have been and I stayed in my hockey skates. I can do anything in these hockey skates except jump and land, but anything right. that has to do with skating. <laughs> so technically it's the same thing, but get it up to a quality refinement to refine the speed. There's te a technical way of going about it. Like women's hockey doesn't have the extra power of the six foot seven slap shot. You understand? Right. They technically refine their skills to be able to have uh, the level that they need to be able to perform. And they'll focus more on that and they have to bring the sport to a certain level. Like if you want a snapshot or slap shot and you measure five foot seven and you want really to have a good slap shot, you're going to work on your skills. The guys, it's brute force. Lorraine, so right. may, may, may I ask a question? Because I play yeah. hockey. I've, I've played hockey and um, I really respect women's hockey. I like it so much better than uh men's hockey i have to say and so i was a i was a i'm a lefty and i'm mm -hmm. a grinder so i like skate fast to the corner grind the puck out but you don't hurt anybody like you don't try to hurt anybody but i will grind them into the corner and dig the puck out mm -hmm. <laughs> to somebody who could actually score because i would score like one I would like be like one goal a season, one assist. And it's just like there I res I really respect the role of a grinder and and in women's hockey, like you're not trying to hurt anybody, right? Do, would you agree with that? Well, they're they're a bit more focused on on playing the game mm -hmm. and you know, having having let's say uh, a, a diminished stature, but though those girls are really strong. Oh, um you you still use your skills and they're not focused as much on ripping somebody's head off or yeah. you know you're never gonna see a girl throw her gloves and smash somebody in the no, face like you do don't. in men's hockey like uh, <laughs> the temperament's not the same the temper i mean and so i was playing i started to, i learned hockey at age 30 i didn't even know how to skate <laughs> <laughs> it's the key thing that's that's the thing so i took and, skating i took skating lessons to, sorry to your point i took i learned how to you know i learned how to skate i took skating lessons and then i kept playing hockey and i'm like what business do i have getting on the ice at 30 but it was a very friendly league and we were all like uh we were the old ladies and then what i would say is like i mean we just had the most fun really a lot of fun but our ice times were shit <laughs> so yeah, they're like okay I have to... you get the residual time slots that's yeah. that's so same way. And it's just like same okay. thing with yeah same thing with figure skaters yeah. uh, like uh i spent most of my time to get some ice time through the city you'd had a limited amount of time yep and if you wanted to get more uh like synchro all the practices People are still in bed and they're on the ice. They're, mm. they're warming up. It's five o'clock in the morning yep. and they're on the ice at six, ready to go for a two hour, three hour practice. Right. And they're doing it more than once a week. They're like right. on the ice at, uh, at that time, maybe three, even four yep. times a week. Mm -hmm. And those time slots you have Sunday afternoon, afternoon <laughs> or Sunday at supper time. It's just I mean like. And yeah. I think I, I would really love to hear more about your mom and the work that she did to get you into sports. And I, I just wanted to say, like, you know, I was a shit hockey player. <laughs> I am still it's a, a hard hockey. sport. It's, gr it's a I hard sport. I love it. I love it. Like it's a game. That's why a, you like it. I yeah. love it. And, you know, yeah. it's very friendly. Um, And I started playing. Uh, my team was older and we started playing against younger women. And mm -hmm. uh, oh, my it's faster. Gosh. They're so fast and they yes. were 
they were more aggressive, but also very respectful. And I'm just at a certain point, I st I'm just I've switched to shinny because mm -hmm. I mean, I'm like, it's 1130 at night. I'm divorced. I have two children. I had to get a babysitter to get here. And I'm at that point, I was fat. I'm like, I can barely get in my hockey pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I love this sport. But I, it's also like, you know, I didn't learn as a as a kid. And I I know you spoke about not being able to play hockey. Yeah. Not feeling welcomed into hockey when you were young. And I just. I would... I'm not alone. There's a lot of people. It was the same thing. Organized hockey didn't exist. Like if you look mm -hmm. at France Saint-Louis, France Saint-Louis has been on the first Olympic uh, team in 98 for Nagano. And there was no way you could play hockey. So it was outdoors when it was uh, the outdoor rinks were up and you were play hockey there. And then. Mm -hmm nothing was built up a structure wise to integrate throughout right. the year. So then some adults, when you became an adult that you actually had access in those days to a hockey league an organized garage hockey league for, for adults. So that's where all the good players from everywhere, everywhere around Montreal, like hours and two hours drive would be in this league. And they would all be gathered in one area, and that was the adult hockey. So all the girls that wound up, a good substantial of girls that wound up on the Olympic team, were playing in this league. Mm -hmm. Drolette, Goyette, yep. Saint Louis, yep. uh, and uh, Therese Brisson. Yep. Uh, these are all girls that were like really great hockey players. So they were all gathered in this league, and they had their level of hockey. Yeah. the A level they called it and they were able to flourish or at least have a bit of competitiveness. And then slowly some of them would kind of like play with guys. If they knew somebody they could, you know, play. To and let them play. Right? But it, it, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't anything there. And now all the leisure opened up, the girls started playing. So there's more mm -hmm. opportunities so more people are yeah. participating. It's kind of yeah. like a catch 22 here. Right. So, right. Right. And I would love to ask you, Douglas, I don't mean to. I don't know. But interject, but well, I am because it's fucking International Women's Day. So, yeah, <laughs> so there <laughs> with respect. But did you ever? Um, I had the great fortune to play with some of the women who played on the Montreal Stars, and they were on, uh, and also some uh, Olympic hockey players. Like, we were playing, like, you know, a, a charity event in, uh, okay. and these women were so gracious. They were, so this is, this is before the Women's Hockey League folded you know like the, yeah, the first uh the first one yeah first, uh, if, yeah and yeah, so and they, like we were like my team we were like timbits players <laughs> 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 we're sitting in the room in the in the in the room with uh is it uh chu teresa chu she was what? yeah she was there and um the woman who was uh i can't remember her name right now but i interviewed her for um I run magazine. I went to Montreal. Caroline Ouellette? Caroline Ouellette or uh... No, it wasn't Carolyn Ouellette. I'll think of it. But um I mean that that they worked so hard and they like this sorry, I'll think it was she was the team captain on the Montreal Stars and for a long time. I'm sorry, I can't remember her name right now, but I did I did interview her and she always had a a full-time job she was a trainer yeah. at concordia yeah. yeah she did athletic training and then she also trained and played professional hockey and i was just like this is bullshit <laughs> yeah well the story about all these players that uh were on the first olympic hockey teams mm -hmm. i don't know if it's changed but financially um it was a huge sacrifice I, uh, everybody had to be centralized in the program that I participated in and, um, uh, they had to leave their jobs. Like, uh, just to give you an idea how unreceptive, uh, of a workplace that France saint we worked in, mm -hmm. um, uh, she's, she's a good friend of mine and she was given an ultimatum. Her job told her it's your job or the Olympics. OK, so she was like devastated because she was, what do I do my job? I, you know, well, I said, you know what, if you don't go to the Olympics, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. 
and living with regret is not a fun thing. So Mm -hmm. go to the Olympics and find yourself another job when you get back. But, and a lot of girls had to leave their employment. So if their employer wasn't very flexible with the whole, I'm not going to be here for a year because it was a year almost uh, of running around, going to camps. They were in Quebec. They were, and then they were centralized to Calgary, but, and then they would train in Toronto. So everybody would fly all over the place. Well, how many days off do you have from work? You know, you're taking all your vacation time and, and you're devoted to trying to participate and you're at your personal expense. And it has been like that forever. Forever. Self, self self-funded or family funded. Right. And like, it's just, this is why we're smashing the patriarchy. <laughs> like, but would you tell a little more about your mom? Well, you have to have a, a good base and parents that support you uh, throughout uh, your youth that are a solid foundation. And I had the luxury of having a great mom uh, and a great dad. But my mom was very devoted into uh, keeping us busy. So... You start off an activity as a youth. You don't know what's going to happen with either you practicing basketball or any sport. Um, So we got good at it, the whole family. (laughs) My sister skates, my brother skates, and I skate. Uh, We're all teachers. Uh, My brother's figure skating coach. My sister is also a figure skating coach, a part-time throughout her full-time job, but the whole family skated. So it became a family activity that we, all the children were invested in. So um, we became good skaters. We had a bit of talent that helped us out. Oh, you had a little bit of talent. Yeah, a little bit of talent. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like, you like it, you're, it becomes a passion and it becomes a family uh, activity. And... You know, there's, there's this saying, uh, the explanation of what luck is, um, and there's out of coincidence also. So all these things that happen to you through life is this def- definition of luck that I have. It's when preparation meets Need opportunity. Oh. And you, you're, you're prepared. You, you have all your baggage. You've been teaching since the age of, you know, 10 uh, you, you brought your, your technical skills to, to a level of refinement and your knowledgeability of all that uh, is implicated in the techniques that are involved with quality of skating. And then you get these opportunities that just show up. But if I had not finished my, my, <laughs> my university degree, if I wasn't teaching, um, and had my certification levels. Mm -hmm. If I had not uh, been teaching power skating, which was something that wasn't structured or or nothing. So it's something that I I developed all the techniques for hockey and relation to everything I know with figure skating and you apply it. And anyways, the outcome, the fact that I also played hockey uh, to mesh my knowledgeability, my skills, my hockey skills with all the knowledge I had for figure skating into what my comprehension was of what a hockey player would need to be able to be fast, agile, and to be able to do all the elements required during a game uh, Mm -hmm. was really a baggage that came together. And then I had already the experience. So but then again, I had to know somebody that was connected with Team Canada. So, but I was prepared when the opportunity came by. Honestly, I, I'm just, I know I don't mean to interrupt. I'm going to turn back to Douglas. But um, Lorraine, I wish, I wish I'd had a coach like you. <laughs> and I know Paul well, has to get to work. I would work, love so. to teach you how to skate. <laughs> I could, so, I, my backwards skating is shit. <laughs> I couldn't stop. Nobody taught me how to stop. I just skated into I the boards. Yeah. But I, I, I really apologize. For, I, I know Paul has to work. So I just thank you so much for the conversation. No problem. It was a pleasure meeting you, Bridget. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, did you, um, 
because you were working with uh, Olympic level players, did you actually get to go as well with them? No, I did not go. I was, uh, I could have gone to the 202 Olympics, but um, it's kind of hard because you're running a business. And if you're not there, because that's the other thing is I became um, the key focal point of the business in, in terms of, uh, service, knowledge, and anything that shows up, uh, problem solving it. And when you're the key person in the business, then uh, the amount of time you can spend away from your business is limited. So I could have gone, but I chose not to. I was offered to go, but I did not go because I had to uh, to take care of my my business. So I watched it on, on TV, but I was very proud of the girls, the way they they rallied together and that was uh, the way they rallied together was um, something beyond coachable. Mm. So this was all girls. They, the, the way they rallied together was the team, really something very impressive to watch, like I mentioned earlier. And um, I'm very proud of what they, they accomplished in the, <laughs> in the state of, <laughs> of that game <laughs> was I'm very proud of them. Anyways, I I met a couple of players every now and then that some show up at the store. uh, And um, anyways, it's, it's hard to keep in touch with, with everybody. And Mm -hmm. I, I was just the power skating coach. Also, I was one, you know, there were a lot of the coach uh, teaching manual skills with the puck. uh, You had the goalie coach. Yeah. A whole bunch of people that were in charge of uh, part of the coaching staff, uh, but uh, it's uh, I, I came across a couple and it's it's really fun to see where they are today. And, you know, it's uh, it's cool. It's a nice experience, I can say. Hmm. Yeah. What if, uh, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I was wondering also because you when you were talking that when you were younger, you wanted to play hockey and you were sort of you know directed to figure skating. Um, I grew up at a time. Um, sort of like a little in between time where ringette was becoming very, very popular. Mm-hmm. And since women's hockey gained more prominence, I hardly ever hear of ringette anymore. So I'm wondering, like, what's the stat? Do you happen to know, like, what's the status of that sport? And, and back yes, in the day, like, how many good female hockey players did we lose because they got funneled into ringette instead? Um, I think it's the other way around. There's a okay. lot more ringette players that got funneled into hockey. Actually, uh, Therese Brisson was one example. Okay. She was playing <clears throat> ringette and she started playing hockey and she wound up on the Quebec team. And we went to nationals a couple of times because I was in charge of the, uh, I was a power skating coach for the senior women's hockey uh, Quebec team that went to a couple of Canadian champions throughout the uh, 1995 to 1997. Um, I was involved with the, uh, La Fédération, the Federation, and I was yeah. coach. And also I went to, uh, to their, their events, the national event with them, with, uh, my sharpening, uh, equipment, to make sure everything was, uh, good. So, um, that, that's, um, uh, one thing that, uh, I can say for ringette because I also work with the AAA team. Uh, every four years, uh, the uh, Quebec Ringette Federation uh, gathers the best players in the province to build up a team that they call Ringette Triple A or okay. Triple A to represent uh, the Quebec uh, province at the Canada Games. Okay. So um, I've been a part of three of those, um, and there, there's still. Let's. That's. I don't hear enough about ringette. Um, there's still a lot of uh, uh, activities, so you kind of have to go outside of your town or city or even your, your region to participate at a certain inter- interesting competitive level. Um, the sport uh, for me is a beautiful sport. It's all based on, on passes and skating skills. Mm-hmm. A lot of the ring at players skate very well. That's uh, when you look at them transfer from ringette to hockey, you notice it automatically uh, with the skating skills the, that they develop 
Uh, it's a different uh, level of uh, uh, learning process. Okay. Because when you skate, um, when you skate with the ringette, the ring, you can skate fast because you don't have to handle the ringette. Right. Once you, you pick it, you can skate like there's no tomorrow. Right. The hardest part of ringette is passing. The hardest part of hockey is skating with the puck because yes. you can lose it. Yes. <laughs> and passing the puck is far easier at hockey because all you have to do is place your, your blade on the ice and the puck hits the blade and you stop the puck. Right. But passing at ringette, you have to synchronize that you're going to pick it while it's being thrown at you. Right. So timing wise, it's a bit more challenging to pick a pass than to receive a pass with a puck. So okay. the, the aspect of liberty and power that they can, you know, give into their skating once they pick the ring is really what makes them, uh, let's say, I think, better skaters because they, they don't have to worry about hauling the puck around or losing the puck so they can really skate like there's no tomorrow. Okay. So the aspect of ring get technically for skating is, is very interesting for that. It's a very nice sport. And I don't think that um, there's enough given in publicity to sustain it. They, they, they're still out there. There's mm -hmm. still, it's a little community in Montreal, competitively, people go around, but we don't hear enough of it. And I will say this, and <laughs> RDS, it's called Le Réseau des Sports. Okay? Well, they should call it Le Réseau du Hockey mm. because that's all they show. Yeah. And Pretty much, yeah. Are you going to be a sports channel and are you going to show other things that are happening in other sports than mishmash hockey, uh, rehash hockey, uh, hockey, and then throw up hockey? And, and, and it's to the point of ridicule. And I, I'm, I'm a bit saddened because uh, we don't hear anything about our, our skiers, uh, our short track. We don't hear anything. Only when it's Olympic, we, we right. have the highlights. And after that, you, can't, you don't hear anything. Well, it's a and shame I, because I so many Quebecois skiers, snowboarders, okay. short tracks, like, I mean, they yeah. all the yeah. Olympic medals, right? Yeah. Well, the, the National uh, Training Center for Short Track, it's is at it Maurice Montreal? Shaw. Yeah. yeah. It's in Montreal. Long track is in Calgary. Right. And because they have the uh, Lano Olympic. Yeah. The Oval, yeah. The oval. So, um, but we never hear anything. And, you know, ring it just gets tossed out like a, right. just a leisure activity, but it's a very fun sport to watch. But if nobody has the uh, capability of being shown the sport, then you cannot create interest. It's a catch 22 thing again. Yeah. So, it's, like it's one of those things too. It's like if you want to go to the Olympics, then if you want to go to the Olympics one day, then you don't play ring it. Because it's not there. Yeah. No. Which is a shame because it's a fast sport. It is really fast. Like really fast. Yeah. And, and faster than hockey in a lot of ways. Because like you said, you don't have to hand, once you get the ringette, once you got it, you just you go. Skate. <laughs> right? You and skate like crazy. Like crazy. Yeah. And, and I've seen <laughs> some matches where those ladies, I would not get on the ice with them. And I mean that sincerely because they would destroy me. Like, because... Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're skating hard, fast, tough. And there is a lot of, I wouldn't say body checking, but a fair bit of collisions. Um, we'll yeah. call it, we, you can call it body checking because body checking is not really part of the game, but it happens. Oh, yeah. Well, it happens. You're on the surface. Uh, everybody's going in different directions at, a, at certainly high speed. So, But uh, I find they don't get enough uh, exposure. And, you know, even figure skating doesn't get very much exposure either. Yep. So everything now is being shifted instead of being on mainstream cable. Mm -hmm. They are being shifted on uh, Internet. Yep. 
And if you want to watch anything in figure skating, you either go on the YouTube ISU channel or, you know, you go to Skate Canada and you can see the competitions live, which is great because we couldn't do that before. Right, right. But in the process, to do that, you already have to have the interest. And if Ringette wants to get interest, it has to go outside of a spectrum and be on cable. To, to be shown a game or to be the same way women's hockey had to slowly, mm-hmm. you know, fight their way to be on cable, to be a, to show the world championship of all things. Well, when was um, the first women's world championship? Like 1990 or 91? 1991. 91. Yeah. Yeah. I think 91. I remember it that. Was, <laughs> there was a couple of women that I knew at the time that were on that team Yeah, and the competition outside of Canada and the U S was almost non-existent at the time. Yeah. Real, Other than Finland, I think Finland was number three yes. back in the day. And that was pretty much yeah. it. But now yeah. you see actually uh, competitive teams competing. Thank goodness. And each year, the Olympics, you see uh, a massive improvement in, in well, Scandinavian countries. That's a given, right? Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark. Yeah. That's yeah. a given Sweden and Finland, especially. Uh, I'm surprised yeah. that the Russians uh, women's hockey team, isn't more competitive because in Russia, that's the sport is hockey. Like that's it. Uh, I mean, so much so that, that, uh, Alexander Ovechkin said he would quit the NHL if he had to, to play for team Russia in the last Olympic games, the previous ones. He says, I don't care about my NHL contract. I want to represent my country in the Olympics and an Olympic gold medal in hockey in Russia is like the be all end all of everything. Yes, That's it the is. Highest exalted thing you can. You yeah, can they achieve. need to win at all costs. Yes, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. as well. Yes. But, and I and I think for women, for yeah. women in Russia, it's it, it, it is figure skating. Yes, yes, Absolutely. that's that's the be all and end all yeah. there. Yeah, a gold they medal. were pre- they were pretty good in synchro also. But yeah. uh, it, if I was to just make a point with uh, Russian uh, women, um, the unhealthy yeah, that the unhealthy uh, training uh, focus and. Um, I came back to that health issue with yep. the after effects of a career in figure skating. And mm-hmm. now I can talk about the, um, now effect or the copy paste effect of yep. wanting to reproduce the successful, uh, way of, of competing, which is catering a, an unhealthy athletic um, a body of skaters that are, let, let's say it. And I've said it and I've had, uh, I had a, a person from RDS in my store. And I mentioned this cause I was having a conversation with a client. I said, I am tired of watching the women's event because I'm under the impression that I'm watching anorexic children skate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these women are supposed to be 16, 17, 18 years of age, some in early 20s, and they look like they're 12. Yeah. And I have a problem also with skaters that have no muscle mass. And that is a tendency. They don't want skaters to weigh anything. They don't yeah. want skaters to be muscularly fit yeah. because that puts on the pounds. Mm-hmm. Muscles put on the pounds. Muscles are the heaviest (laughs) thing you can add on to a body weight as body weight's concerned. So when I see the knee joint bigger than the quad, I am really alarmed. And this is what they're catering. So copy paste, it's making its effect. Everybody here started, you know, putting their skaters on on a scale each time every day going on no, the no, ice no, no, and creating no. an issue with uh with the uh, eating yeah. an well, eating disorder that's what they created again right i come from the dance world there was like ballet right yeah. all, all those girls it's the same thing and there was this moment of time when i was watching figure skating and again like you say the the russian women um there was a period of time not too long ago i think like in the last 20 years or so where there were a lot of uh, Russian figure skaters that were just coming like out of nowhere in the Olympic cycle about two years, three years before they were 14, 15, 16, their bodies mm-hmm. were bending like crazy and you'd only see them from one Olympic cycle and then they disappear. And there's like a big series of them. And a lot of them had yeah. like 
almost like toothpicks for legs. And whenever I see figure skaters, I like, like tiny little toothpicks for legs. I'm thinking like, like where is the girl? Like I'm looking at the Canadian girls, you know, they've got like the big meaty thighs and quads, right? Because mm -hmm. you're jumping and you're landing and you need something to absorb all of that and keep that muscle. And I just keep on thinking, I'm watching them jump and I'm thinking like her leg is going to just like snap in half. Like this, they don't fortunately in competition, but again, with the number of jumps and the repetition and landing over and over yeah. and over again on that knee, landing. And if you don't have the softest of knees to absorb mm -hmm. the shock, on the, I, I don't know because it's Russia. We don't know what happens to them after that one cycle when they disappear, but I'm sure that there's a lot of them again, like, like you say, what's happening to their Rush hips, girl, what's maybe. happening to their, yeah. you know, yeah. they, they must be, really damn because you haven't fully developed yet at that no. age either like this so you're doing things to your body that technically no person should ever be doing to their body no. at an age where you know joints are growing or before you've had your growth spurts and, and i know for women in particular right because they like to get them that young before puberty hits and you know you develop breasts and then that, that or you get your growth spurts which mm -hmm. completely changes your center of gravity for everyone but particularly mm -hmm. for women a lot of men, you see a lot of uh, women, sometimes they come in, they, they jump to the top of the sport, and those who stay in it sometimes like disappear like down the rankings for four or five years because they have to relearn the technique from scratch all over again, especially mm -hmm. the jumping technique, once yeah. they mature. Yeah. Well, the minute you uh, either grow too fast or put on weight, it changes the whole dynamic of uh, the technical skills because it's a physics. So uh, more weight... Uh, and some people can lose all their jumps for a year if they grow like yeah. two, three inches mm -hmm. and they really scratch a lot and they don't know why they lost everything. And, and then you turn around and you say, well, gee, you're a lot taller than you used to be. And they, they kind of forget to look at how high or how much growth they've, they've done in a year or so. And that would explain all the loss of balance, the loss of control. It's like you're, Muscle mass has to have the time to grow, to get stronger for the more length of body yeah. you have to mm -hmm. control. And that that is that happens a lot in figure skating. Well, remember and what... And other comparable sports also. Yes. Okay. I was going to say, remember what we, and I say we collectively as society, did to Tanya Harding, right? Because Tanya Harding was rough and tumble, uh, for want of a better term, trailer park wrong side of the tracks she came from very humble beginnings uh basically lived in in poverty but she was a very strong powerful skater who did not look like your standard you know stick thin uh 100 pound or less she was skater she was a skater and a powerful skater and she was the first woman to do the, the trip the triple lutz thank you i think it was yeah and, and or Axel, sorry. Triple, triple Axel. Axel. She was the very first woman to ever do it in competition. And they told her not to do it. And she's like, screw you, I'm doing it anyway. So mm -hmm. it's because she swam against the tide. Skated against the tide. Mm -hmm. But she swam against it. And as a result, we railroad, we as society railroaded her because she didn't fit the mold of Nancy Kerrigan. You know, that type of mold. And even Nancy Kerrigan, who was good friends with Tanya Harding, hated what they did to Tanya Harding. Mm-hmm. And I mean, her husband was a piece of human garbage and what his buddy did. And they tried to, you know, it's like, I watched a documentary about her recently and it's like, wow, did we have it wrong? And you know who was complicit in making, painting that picture? The media. They painted oh, the picture sure. of sure. this, you know, wrong side of the tracks. Oh yeah. And there Linda's talking, yes, about Syria Bonnelly from France. She did a backflip yes. in competition because they said, you can't do that. She's like, screw you. I'm doing it. Yeah, and I love disqualified her. But I remember the first time I watched Surya Bonnelly skate in competition, Ooh. she blew my mind. Yeah, I know. The blew things she mind. could do. She came to my store a couple of times and oh, she, yeah. she, yeah, she is very athletic, like oh, yeah. very athletic, she, muscle mass, strong. Um, she's actually the first person, like you're talking about the back foot. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's the first skater that almost brought the backflip to being legal because most guys like, uh, uh, you know, did the backflip, they would take off and they mm -hmm. would land 
two feet on the ice. Now, figure skating, the jumps, they all take off on an edge, which is one side of the blade. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it can be either side. Some jumps are different depending on the edge you take off. And um, you have to take off on an edge and you have to land on one foot. So I've seen her take off on an edge and land on one foot doing the backflip. Wow. I've seen her in shows and she's the one who almost brought this. So then they decided that you can't turn you have to be vertical in your rotation and not horizontal in your rotation. So they eliminated that trick that a lot of skaters are, are doing today still in shows. They're all over doing backflips. And well, the institution of skating is just basically it holds it back and reins it in. It's like, if you don't fit our mold, we don't want you. That's well, how it's we, been for decades, right? We, we get into your favorite subject, Paul. Politics. Yes. And it's there very political. Go. It's very exactly. political. It's yeah. it's exactly the same thing, and pretty much sports have to deal with that aspect also in figure skating in particular. And I think the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, National Figure Skating Association, the USFSA, are probably responsible for what you are mentioning. The media probably made a, f a fest out of the situation, mm -hmm. but the whole um, the whole situation, I think came back to uh, the USFSA was responsible for, for taking care of their athletes, um, maintaining a certain level of, uh, of repetition of high level performances. That's what all the associations are given as a challenge to, to keep uh, um, skaters uh, at their highest level of performance to get, you know, all the results that they, they get for their country. And, um, you know, at one point you prefer, you have so you prefer one skater more than the other. And mm -hmm. then you choose out of, or you prefer everything that comes out of this coach and all the rest of the people have to fight. So we see this happen often, even locally. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you bring it on a national perspective. Canada's no different. I'm sorry. I, no, I would no, like I to know. say that we're different, but we're not. We're not. So, you know, like, the performance that, let's say, Quebecers have to, to dish out to be valued or recognized or, or even have the results that, you know, has to be sometimes, you feel like it has to be so much above to be recognized to the point that they can't play the games and, you know, switch whoever they want on the podium. Mm -hmm. So your performance has to outcompete to a point of recognition mm -hmm. that the judges can't, they'll, they'll look can't real bad. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, like if you want to look at the highest point, the highest point of, do I have the right to say this? When the shit hit yeah. the fan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The highest point of shit hit the fan in figure skating came in 202 yep. at the Olympics with Sally Pelletier. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yep. and nobody knows what happened after. I'll tell you what happened after. Oh, please. It was yes. the best thing that ever happened for Sally Pettier. Yep. Okay. They, they outskated, mm -hmm. like, no questions asked. Even anybody not knowing about figure skating or Could the intricate yeah. details yeah. of all the techniques implicated. Yeah. That, knew. that was the love story routine, I believe, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they did marry. Yeah. But, and, since the and they skated on the yeah. love story, so it kind of yeah. like meshed into their performance. No, it's memorable. Like if you like think like like, very, like the, very some, the top ten pairs figure skating exactly. routines at one time, so, the love story one was everywhere. Oh yes. yes, we came to the judging, and it was still yeah. under the old system. So yeah. whatever you decided or whatever money you got on the backside as as a judge um, mm -hmm. couldn't couldn't play this out the way they had, they had planned it. And the fact that they didn't give uh, the gold medal and they positioned this couple second, yep. uh, it just blew up in their face. So the shit hit the fan and it was so obvious that it was not judged properly that uh, the International Olympic Committee gave an ultimatum to ISU, clean up your sport or you're out of the Olympics. Nobody talks about this, but that was the ultimatum given to figure skating. And all of a sudden they decided to implement the new point system and change the whole thing because 
I guess, staying in the as an Olympic event was a priority. And they cleaned up the sport slash throughout the judging methods that they they apply today. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a very interesting thing to see. And it would take away a bit the possibility of somebody playing around with the points to kind of create the outcome or desired art outcome that they would like. Yeah. But it's still possible today. Yeah. To, it did change but, uh, figure skating, though. It really did. Yeah. That moment. Yeah. It, it brought in the point system that we that we have now, where yeah. and and the, the with the video judges that actually did you actually land it? Did you you know? Did you under rotate? Did you over rotate it? Did you land yeah. on the right edge so that you actually got credit for what you actually did, not just what it looks like? And I, I remember that that thing when two thousand two was almost was preceded. Because back, I'm not sure if it's still the same today, but back in the day, ice dance, like the, we had the ISU for one thing, and the, I think it was the International Ice Dance Union, I think was different. Uh, it was a different group of people, a different organization. I'm not sure back then, but we had the times when we had Born in Kratz at that yeah. time, because the Olympics in 97, 98, it, they came in with the hydro bleeding and all those yeah, interesting things. In little, yeah, 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 like I said, so they were going against the culture as well. They were trying to bring more athleticism to the sport and yeah. it was under that 6.0 system like this and they slotted them in fourth and then they went back to the next elect. It's in 21, 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. and, again, and again, they slotted them in fourth. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, this is one of the most memorable ice dancing teams in the entire history of figure skating. They've won tons of medals at the Worlds, never won an Olympic medal, they kept on placing them fourth just to say that they couldn't have it. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah. I guess. And then Saleh and Peltier happened, and I think just Canadians just had like, okay, hey, stop picking on us. <laughs> well, number it, wasn't, one. it wasn't just Canadians. <laughs> Americans came to the, to the they went yeah. to the, the plate on that one. At that they point, really did. yes. Because they were yeah, like, Yeah, everybody on. came to the plate. And what was interesting, like I said, it was the best thing that happened to Sally Peltier because they were on every talk show in the United yep. States. Right. Every everybody one. wanted to have them on. And they they be, they they made the, I could say they it was a, a, a positive outcome out of a bad bad situation, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it uh, it really put them on on, on the map. And well, I, I remember watching that and when they, they were standing there waiting for their scores and, you know, they have the kiss and cry booth mm -hmm. and the camera was on them and the booze from the audience, from the scoring, right? Yes. And, and they looked at Saleh and let's not get into her politics because Jesus no, no. Christ, but they looked at Saleh and her, her look on her face was like, eh, that's, that's figure skating. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so she knew the fix oh, yeah. was in. Yeah, she well, knew. yeah, it's 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 kind of like uh, almost decided ahead of time, and yeah. you yeah. you hear it in the woodworks what's preparing, and you have to really like, uh, let's say uh, the first place has to really outperform, and they make, didn't. Yeah, to be, you have to outperform always more, and when you look at things at the Olympics, the whole thing changes in perspective mm -hmm. of. Uh, just go back up to all the Olympics, even going into the 60s. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying that all Russians didn't deserve to win sometimes the medals mm -hmm. that they got, but there is a substantial amount of, of game that has been happening for a long time. And I think... Uh, yeah. um, but it's been a common thing. Like, I remember, like, even like the, from, I mean, they were Canadian, but they skated for France, the Duchesnes. Yeah, from Elmer. <laughs> they were always kept off the podium for the longest time. And then when we had Elvis Stoiko come around mm -hmm. for, for the longest time, like this, he was too athletic, right? Because he came from martial arts. Oh, and he was he too, brought, and I guess, yeah, he was, he he was too, he was, to too yeah, he brought too, and we, and yeah. we couldn't have that. Like, we, like, yeah. no, no, no. They tried to keep him down for the longest time, too. And then there was somebody else that, that came to mind off the top of my head, and I just lost it. But there was a long series of that. It's like, you, you know what? You just don't fit into our mold, and we mm -hmm. will deny you. Like, everybody's seeing it on ice, what's happening. Yeah, like this the level of athleticism or the level of creativity. Yes, and will deny you. Uh, another one was um, not from uh, Canada, but from uh, Switzerland. Lucinda Rue, the best spinner. She has like Guinness World Records for the number of revolutions <laughs> she can do it next to minute. Next, and the thing was spinning right. It's it's the not traveling, right? 
she could like just start spinning right. super fast, change pos like positions 12, 13 different times in a spin. And never, when you watch the ice, mm -hmm. there wasn't like those, those Massive swirly things. Body, so she was yeah. just on one spot because, and she would yeah. never get rewarded. Like, cause because like, we could only give this much for spins. It's like, but have you seen her spin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, this is a spin that's worthy yeah. of a quad, like give her the points. And they, they just would not. But it's, it's, it's been the sad part, I think, of figure skating and people who want to control the outcome of competitions uh, don't realize how damaging it is for the sport. Oh, God, yeah. And it the popularity. People aren't blind. They see yeah. on the ice that this is really freaking amazing. I, I can tell you for a fact, because I'm all on all aspects of the sport, I can tell you for a fact that when Sally Peltier didn't get what they deserved, Mm -hmm. And it was such a fiasco. Uh, usually after Olympics, people are motivated to, to, to get into sports. And I'd have like an overflow of clients that come in and want to start nice. skating. And then, and, then, and it was not that effect. It was the contrary. It was mm -hmm. like, it's a corrupt sport. I'm not putting my kid in that sport. Yep. And that was the effect of it. It and took a decade and a half to has recover. gone down in popularity. If you look at the 90s, Kurt Browning, who's mm -hmm. my favorite skater ever, mm -hmm. the most mm -hmm. complete artist mm -hmm. uh, anybody wants to uh, <laughs> to see on a pair of mm -hmm. skates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it was so popular then. And it was Elvis Stoiko and all these. And the you were on the TV, you were shown, yep. the competitions were shown, the Canadians were shown, and yep. it was like a big thing on, on, on CTV. Yep. And now you got to search for it. You got to yeah. search for it or you got to go watch it online. And, you know, the United States don't help very much because they have the rights of any national or world level mm -hmm. events and they only show the U.S. and the rest of the people right. don't exist. Right. So you, they don't show the, the the fourth place or the third place if it's not an American, and then you don't get the whole outcome. And I was told this by U.S. clients of mine that yeah. come mm -hmm. up from Vermont and New York to sharpen their skates. They show up and they, thank God I can catch the Canadian channels because I couldn't watch the, anything. Like they would show yeah. four or five skaters and that was the end of the event. Like the rest of the people didn't exist. So. Yeah. Figure skating has taken a, a huge downfall in popularity uh, because it's not shown on cable anymore. And it's not shown on, on uh, any uh, substantial uh, TV network. So it coming out of that is a long process. And it's I don't think we're we came we're going to come back soon or going back to what it used to be because now it's shifted into uh, something else. But in the aspect of things, there's a lot of uh, all the money you get out of events, uh, you know, all the publicity and all the it, the sport is suffering in a sense because you don't get all that aspect of things happening because you're not on cable or on major mm -hmm. networks as yeah. an event is concerned. So. Yeah. The other person I was remembering, sorry, Mr. Grizzly, uh, was mm -hmm. Elizabeth Manley mm -hmm. because oh. when she was skating, there was three on the road. There was three three categories when you were skating. You had you had the the free program and you had the technical program, the short. Mm -hmm. But you also had figures, figures. That you had to yeah. do at the time like this. And they would always sink her. They'd place her fifth or eighth after figures, and then she'd have to climb back. So the fact yeah. that that, that yeah. silver she got in Calgary, like was oh, even yeah. more because they 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 basically shot her down the rankings on figure on figures. Yeah. If it weren't for figures, she would have gotten the gold, the gold. and actually right. beaten Katrina Vitt. And There's a lot of like, skaters that are in the same situation. But and they would just take her right out of the company. Like they were using yeah. figures to oh, yeah. rule people to, out right yeah. off the bat to, to uh, kill your yeah. chance of winning before you even started. It would have been hard to, you know, go on the ice with, to see all the lines and figure out who did it best. It's, it was, yeah. uh, it was a, a, an opportunity to manipulate the results if, if needed. Yeah. Yeah. I think and, um, if yeah. it's going to move forward, and gain a bigger audience it's going to do it on this milieu this youtube like a live streaming event because that's where young people go young people don't watch television they don't yeah it's tables so... non-existent to them it's all on <laughs> online on stream. so you can do it on your phone wherever you are on planet earth exactly. just pull up your phone boom go to the youtube mm -hmm. there you can see it 
what I think would enhance the sport, and please, both of you, tell me if you think I'm out of my mind in saying this, but what I think would enhance the sport and keep it clean, even with the new point system, okay, is if we got rid of judges altogether and went with an AI. Hmm. What do you think about that? Like, no judges, so that there's no personal preference there at all. It's an AI mm -hmm. that is trained. You teach the AI what the move should look like, how they should be manipulated, how you should land a jump, and this and that and the other thing. And yeah. then let the AI monitor it in real time. Because an AI can monitor uh, something like a teraflop of data in a split second, which is more than the human brain can comprehend on a single subject simply due to the fact that the human brain also has to keep the blood flowing the heart beating you know? yeah your eyes open your eye, yep. yeah exactly <laughs> whereas an ai can literally just concentrate on the one thing you ask it to concentrate on so yeah. i'm thinking in the future for sports that are judged mm -hmm. any sport whether it's uh, aerials uh big air and in, in snowboarding diving. diving all of that get the judges out have an ai do it now I know people are going to freak about that, but I guarantee you at some point in time, that will happen. So I think for figure skating, that could work for the technical score. I'm not sure how it works for the artistic component, however. I don't know yeah. how it would work for the artistic component. That would be component. a bit harder for the artistic component. I, I do agree with you. Uh, Unless we can train unless, the AI um, to be artistically inclined. The, the other thing, just to point out just a little, is uh, the AI is going to function as good as the, it's programmed for. Right. And... You know, I'll give you an example. What you what gratification are you going to give is basically what you hope judges are capable of doing to gratify, let's say, an element. But I'll give you an example for synchro. Synchronized skating right now, if you make an element, let's say a pivoting block or a no-hold block, mm -hmm. and you have one team that's skating a lot slower, but stays more structured because you're more capable of staying structured if you're going slow. Right. So then you get the points for staying structured, but they don't put in the component of doing the same element with twice the speed. So, and it's still a problem today. Like even the judges uh, locally, uh, I have a team that I work with, um, well, they, they were told by the judges, the coaches, uh, we, don't, we don't give more points for speed. And I'm like, why not? I said, well, it makes no sense because right. if you make an element, 16 girls at high speed, mm -hmm. there's far more chances of getting out of line, getting out of a position, getting out of structure, and then losing points. Right. But if you do it fast, they've never, and the time I've been involved with skating since 207, they never gratified on a Canadian level. They yeah. never gratify the teams that are doing their elements in, in high speed or even yeah. at over speed. Yeah. And for me, you're like, okay, but it makes no sense. But so if you program your AI <laughs> to only look at structure and then you don't, you don't program it to value uh, the GOE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the technical difficulty part, and you don't gratify it because it's done at high speed. Then you would have your IA flawed in its process. Yeah. That's the point I have. So yes, yeah. the capability of seeing stuff like tennis. I don't know why they don't already have all those things. Oh yeah, the, the, what is the eagle eye they have for the yeah. lines? Yeah, they have that now. Hawkeye. Yeah. System. Hawkeye, thank you. Yeah. yeah there's so even in, the... in international soccer or football, however you want to call it, they have the goal line technology, multiple cameras, then they have VAR video assisted review. No, oh, it makes sense. It makes yeah. a lot. It makes the sport fair. Yes. Yeah. Judge what was done, score what was actually done. Not yeah, you, what was actually done, done and then you, you slow motion the, it. And yeah. If you had the chance, if you have the opportunity to see what was actually done, why wouldn't you judge that? Yeah. But when you want to control the outcome, you don't want to go there. Yeah. You know, that's why figure skating never got fixed before the shit hit the fan in 202. Yep. Yeah. So you don't want to go there because you want to control the outcome. You want to control who wins, you know, who's preferred to win. And, and then you get back to uh, even uh, the Russian system 
you're talking about the girls that you see once and then you don't see them again. Yep. Well, they have like uh, a whole bunch of skaters waiting for their turn. Yeah. And this is exactly what's happening. And that's why uh, the ISU is allowing this. They're very much aware of it. They're not doing anything with the uh, unhealthy uh, training environment mm. and the very physically uh, <laughs> impact on all their, uh, their bodies. Uh, they're not doing anything and they're not, they're, they're not, you know, uh, as I would expect for such a, uh, an organization that's supposed to cater to safe sport. And they're, this is what they're dishing down our throats as coaches, uh, l'association canadienne d'entraîneurs, the ACE, mm-hmm. and, uh, I don't know the uh, English, uh, abbreviation Canadian association for of coaches. Yeah, and uh, we're supposed to do ethics, and we're supposed to do ethics tests every year, and we're supposed to do the sports, safe sports, and we're supposed to do all these things. And then how hypocrite is it to turn around and see what they decide to, you know, avoid looking at in, mm-hmm. in the aspect of, of uh, their athletic, uh, they want athletic outcome, but they don't care, they don't at one point, not taking care enough of the athletes themselves. Yeah, well, the the best example recent one we had was at the last Olympics, the, the Russian skater Kamila Valieva, mm-hmm. who during the Olympics, it seems that, I mean, she had submitted for a sample for a drug test at the 2022 Olympics, and it came back positive for trimetazidine, which I'm mm-hmm. not quite sure what that does. But everybody watching that is going like, I'm not sure that a 14 or 15 year old girl decided on her on her own to say, "Hey, give me some of that trimetazidine. I, I need some of that." That was given to her. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Right, and then this whole long drawn out process because it's been like two years de- determining what actually happens to her status, and because she competed in the team competition, this is something that's right like big in the sports world right now. Everybody thought, okay, well, now we've found yes they've decided that yes, she is guilty and she is going to have that suspension when they're they're turning around says, well, does Russia lose their medal in the team competition? Because she was the female skater, the lady Mm -hmm. single skater that was on the team competition. Usually on a team, if one person gets accused from doping, the whole team suffers. Yes, like this, exactly. it happens in relay teams, right? Right, with yeah. one like this, the whole team relay team loses the race, and all they did was they decided like to lower her points a little bit. It is, and Russia gets to keep the medal. And the reason why it's a big scandal in Canada is because Canada finished fourth in the team competition. Yeah. Everybody expected that Russia would be eliminated as a result of that, and that we would get the bronze medal. And turn to turn around, whoops, nope, that's the ISU. Again, the ISU like so they not- have evidence that's like an yeah. underage child <clears throat> mm-hmm. was being administered performance enhancing drugs of some kind, most likely not at her request. Most and likely. they're still allowed to compete. Yeah. Well, it's. Um, and they still get to keep the medal, even. Yeah. I, I think that was a totally bad decision by the ISU. And I agree with you. They should have been booted off as a team, booted off as a team. Because to tell you the truth, nobody knows this, but uh, every, every uh, team player on Team Canada gets tested uh, and they're not announced when they are. So, you know, they, they just show up at a practice, they're being tested. They show up at what they're being tested after the, the gold performance. They're being tested. Yep. If there's the one girl that if there's one girl that tests positive for whatever, uh, the whole team loses its medal. Right. And I think the ISU uh, made a very bad decision. I don't know if they're scared of you know uh, because it's uh, the Russian country. Yep. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but. I think it's a very bad decision and the implications on uh, doping for the Olympics. If you go back at all the other athletes that went through the same process of being booted off for, mm-hmm. you know, of all things, a snowboarder for, 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 
Yeah, yeah. You know, that's not a drug enhancing. Uh, no, it's not performance enhancing at all. Especially when you're doing something at fast speeds. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, you know, that was a farce and a half. And, you know, in today's reality, he would still have his medal. I th didn't they didn't they allow him to keep it af after all? I'm not quite sure. I might mis might be misremembering that. It I, might it might have took a lot of years I, before. Yeah, because I, 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 I my remember my memory is that they allowed him to keep it, but the, because it wasn't on the band list, but then they added it afterwards. Okay. Cannabis, but I might be wrong on that. I'd have to look that one up. But that that for me, it's it's. Uh, it, it shouldn't have taken two years to come to a decision, more than two years to come to a decision. Yeah. It, it should have been taken within the, uh, the whole process of the Olympics because- The medal uh, ceremony was delayed like throughout the entire Olympics yeah. as well. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah, for they haven't received uh, their medals yet in Canada. I don't think is going to get it, but- um, it's, but nobody it's got it. Like so, all these people, that everybody else that competed mm -hmm. and did earn their medals, didn't get their Olympic moment. Oh yeah, they yeah. got robbed of it. Yeah, exactly. And that's not the type of event you just can go back to and pretend and <laughs> no, and redo it somewhere else without the whole. Uh, no, it's a uh, it's a lost moment. It's mm -hmm. really not a great way to uh to promote uh the olympics in general to allow something to sustain and float decision wise it's a black and white situation yeah it's a black and white situation for me you know you're either drug for en enhancing performances and if you are detected as so there's no debating mm -hmm. there's no debating and the outcome of this situation is uh, the age limit now that has been modified in figure skating for be able to participate at the Olympics. Uh, let's say that uh, uh, anybody under age cannot participate. They, there's an age limit. I think it's uh, 16 or 17 years old or something like that. So uh, the whole uh, figure skating machine production in Russia for these anorexic uh, children that they're producing uh, is going to hit a bit of a wall, but they still um, have to wait for the girls to get a certain age before actually being able to participate at the Olympics. So, mm. yeah. so that, that's the outcome of that situation, but still the outcome of, you know, coming to a decision and it's a black and white one. You cheated. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember that uh, also in uh, to not to but like on cross country skiing, it was the same thing as well because there was a lot of doping there. And again, another Canadian athlete, I think, it was Becky Scott. Yes, it went to I think it was I think it was Salt Lake City, but it was like two and a half years after the Olympics ended, she finally became the first North American woman to win uh, to win an Olympic medal in cross country skiing. But the goal for her was the gold medal winner. In that race, Olga Danilova was found eventually to have drugged, and they removed her medal. And then later on, then Larissa Lazatina right. was disqualified as well. And then all of a sudden, you know, so she, she got bumped up to silver. And then all of a sudden, whoops! Now you're getting the gold. Two and a half years later, again having your Olympic moment because you can't go back. It's not like no. they go back to the next yeah. Olympics, invite her and like hold a medal ceremony in 2004. Yeah. But even if they did that. Right, it's not the people in front of whom you compete. Yeah, yeah. You don't right? have your people, and you're not with your fellow uh, participants and your fellow team like, uh, members because you're part of the Canadian team. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. Like you dream of, right? You go to the yeah. Olympics. You dream of like that that a medal of any kind, but you or yeah. or your personal best, depending on your abilities. But that mm -hmm. gold medal moment when you're on the podium and that flag comes up and you're singing your national anthem, exactly. Like this, like this, and yeah. like you know, it's like two and a half years later, and she's at Calgary Olympic Park, and they put a little podium like this. They like, and there's like like twelve people there, and it's like. Yeah, it's not the same. Not the same. <laughs> it's not remotely. Just not the same. No. Yeah. Not yeah. remotely. So that's what I mean. It's 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 like there. When you've earned your moment, right? You've put in all that that hard work, those dedications. You've earned your moment, and you have it denied to you. It's like. 
you know, she joined the world, uh, the WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and she became a great ambassador for sport nonetheless. Mm-hmm. But those types of things are the types of things that make people go, you know what, screw it. Right? You could have had a whole career. You reached the pinnacle of your sport. You know, you could probably take, like, even like all the contra, like you win a gold medal, you get advertising deals, why not? She didn't get that either. No, no right? it was too long after. It's too long after you don't the moment remember. Is you gone. Don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, there's so much that gets taken from someone, mm-hmm. right? Because when when you win like the gold medal, you strike when the iron's hot. Like some people win a gold medal and then retire soon after that, but then like they get a call up to like coach something or to become a broadcaster or something. Like again, all of that gets lost. You lose that yeah. because you know, like I said, too much time has passed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, there needs to be something. Those decisions have to come faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. that's uh, that's a good point. Yeah. It's one of the uh, the problems with uh, being able to test and do everything fast on the spot. It's kind of there's only a couple of tests or a fair amount of tests that they can do on the spot, but mm. then all the rest is done after because there's there's a lot of athletes. So yeah. the logistics about that is, I think, the most. Uh, difficult thing to uh to organize would be the most difficult thing to organize to be yeah. able to have all the test results within the event itself the time span of the event yeah yeah, yeah. if you um had to make a recommendation in terms of if we're getting back to figure skating as to what could be done um to boost the popularity of the sport again what what would you suggest well, locally, there's an issue. Okay. Nationally, there's an issue, or there's many issues, but um, people have to see the sport. So if it's not going to be broadcast, um, locally, I'll tell you what's going on, and I find it atrocious, okay? So locally, you have your little competitions and not all national or provincial level skaters. You have tons of competitions and competitions have become a monetary gain event for the people holding the competition. So you're, th- you're having a competition at your club, people are coming, but they're always feeding off the same people financially. So right. let's say grandma, grandpa wants to go see their, their granddaughter skate or their grandson skate to get in it's costing more and more and more okay okay so just to give you an idea um you know when it costs 20 bucks per person to go watch a family member skate for two minutes and a half on the ice it's a bit expensive show wise you know it's an expense but then you already paid a big amount just to participate Mm -hmm. to be able to do your two minutes and a half on the ice. And then you want to charge everybody that goes into the venue or the arena to watch a family member skate. So then bring it up to provincial level. Do you know how much it costs to participate at provincials? No, I have no idea, actually. I right. used to know a long time ago when my sisters competed. Okay, but well, what would you think ago. would be the amount? Like a participate, par- participating at the provincials, you have to be prov- provincial level skater. Right. Okay. So you've spent thousands just to get to that level to begin with, yeah. right? And then you oh. have to pay your coach to coach you while you're mm-hmm. there. And if you're yeah. somewhere else, let's say not close to your house, you have to pay for a hotel and right. the whole thing yeah. there. Just to that's, participate, but, but that's a reg, but you're talking about like a registration fee that doesn't yeah. count all of that. Just to participate, you, you yeah, are, just to so partici- if you qualify for provincials, you still have to pay to compete. The fact that yeah, you qualify exactly. doesn't get you in. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And what's that? Twelve hundred dollars? Two thousand dollars? No, it's it's less than that per person. Mm-hmm. Uh, it varies between. Let's say somebody told me like maybe five or six years ago that. Going to provincials is $265 to go skate for three minutes. Yeah, that's a lot. Because it really is. It's three minutes, right? Yeah. yeah and, like, and if you fall on the first jump. Minutes, four minutes for senior higher yeah. levels. But, I am told by a lot of fellows that I know jump. that three minutes is a long time, though. A lot of guys say three minutes is a long time. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it, it's and then you, Douglas, you were talking to me. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get I had to drop a little bit of humor in there. It's you, Friday. Morning. You were talking to me about um, the person who was skating that you know that did synchro. Yeah. Well, that was a Canadian national level um, right. event. Okay. And my granddaughter, not my granddaughter, my niece was there. Okay. Okay. She was an intermediate. And my sister wanted to participate and see her going at this level of competition because it's really cool. Right. But it was $40 a day. There's three days of competition, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. So put two parents... Two parents showing up, wanting to see the synchro event and or any event. So it's minimum two days. Okay. So the expense just to go in the rink was, it's too much. Because yeah. first you pay for your child to be able to go. And then you have to pay to be able to go see them. Yeah. And they want to make money, money, money. But in the counter effect, nobody's in the stands. Right. Yeah. So if you want to look at the events, nobody's in the stands. That's what I look at. Nobody's mm. in the stands. Mm. At nationals, pairs, dance, singles, nobody was in the stands. Mm -hmm. Synchro, nobody was in the stands. Mm -hmm. The rink is empty it cost 80 bucks to go between 140 or 60 or 80 dollars to 80 dollars to go depending where you're sitting mm. yeah just to go see mm -hmm. so and it was in calgary so they could have gone like open the doors and promote the sport mm -hmm. and right. have all the local clubs come and see the best skaters in canada right and that's not what happened. Well, so greed took over, right? They want to charge everybody forty, sixty, well, eighty dollars to get in. If they yeah. want the sport to get popular, uh, maybe they're going to have to rethink this, event, the this aspect of things. So yeah, yeah. you can't it, be what you don't see. Yeah, yeah. And if it's going to cost you eighty dollars, the mom brings her child because uh, a, a seven or twelve year old is not going to go to the rink alone. So you're out one hundred and sixty dollars just mm -hmm. to watch. And I'm sorry, but the event is not that long. No, you have 20 skaters doing their programs an hour and a half later, two hours, it's done. So that is an issue for me. It's mm -hmm. too expensive to participate or to watch as a spectator. And all the people that are in the stands are the parents of skaters, family members that are dishing out the money so they can see their family members skate. Well, and, and, and there's, there's another thing here that, that makes, that, as you talk about this, it, it reminds me of the battle in the United States of America for NCAA athletes, for basketball players and football players who have, you know, those schools land massive television contracts that bring in billions of dollars and the exactly. athletes get nothing, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. The stands are I mean, full, the television contracts, like we're about to start March Madness, right? For basketball, right. NCAA basketball. That tournament generates billions in revenue for television uh, broadcasters, for all the schools involved, the winner. It's crazy. They're now, finally, the NCAA is going, okay, I, I guess we should start to pay some. You think? Well, well they get a free <laughs> education. Yeah, but what if the guy blows out his knee and he was hoping to make yeah. it to the NBA or the NFL and that's it. His, his athletic career is over. Here's the thing they don't tell you about that. Yeah, if that happens, his scholarship is yanked. Exactly, because he's not playing basketball anymore. He's not playing basketball or football anymore, so they don't yeah. have a scholarship. Yeah. So they don't get the free education if they get hurt. Mm -hmm. Well, and they're not well, getting well, paid. as well though. With all the games and then being on the road, whatnot, they don't actually get the education. <laughs> they're That's not the there for the thing, classes. Right? That's a cash twenty-two there. <laughs> so here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm proposing. Do what they do for. And let's not get into the politics of what the British Museum represents, but there's no entry fee. It's pay whatever you can afford. So I think if they set up something like that, and tell me if I'm crazy about this, but I think if they set up something like that for amateur figure skating, and again, this is where I'm tying into the NCAA, amateur mm -hmm. figure skaters, if you are competing at an international level, you're still ranked as amateur, but come on, 
I mean, really, that's a professional level at that point. If you're in an international competition and you are in the running to, you know, podium or, or place in the top 10, mm -hmm. you are basically a professional. You're just not getting paid for it, which is how these skating unions are able to do what the NCAA does and make lots of money but yeah. don't pay any of the performers. So I'm kind of thinking like if it's not an international competition, um, all of the entry fees cover the cost of the rental and maintenance of the rink and all the maintenance people that take care of it. Are so the expenses people, for the judges, it's which all is covered. the other thing. Yeah. That's all covered by the entry fee. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to take my family, why don't you just let me pay whatever the hell I think I can afford to pay or not at all? and just sit in the stands and watch. Cause I'm only going to stay there to watch my kid and then I'm out. Cause mm -hmm. I've got three other kids in tow that that one's got to play hockey in two hours. And this one's got a <laughs> cub scout meeting or something. Yeah. And this is what families face. So it's like, once you get to an elite level, sure, sure pay, but anything below international competition or a national competition, just mm -hmm. let people in for free, man. And, cause your stands are empty cause people can't afford to go. Pretty much. Because it's too steep an expense. Exactly. And yeah, it's too steep of an expense. So that's the catch-22. Like the catch-22, I'll bring it to this because I go in the United States and then you watch TV and what's happening down there is that you can't see any sports on the regular uh, channels. Mm -hmm. You have to you have, have all the specialties. You have to absolutely pay an arm and a leg to watch the sports on a specific sports channel. So mm -hmm. yep. uh, hopefully we, well, we have TSN that's kind of like multi-sport oriented, but you want to see a uh, basketball in the States, you have to have the basketball channel. Yeah. If you want to watch yeah. the baseball, you got to have the baseball channel. And then yep. you're, you're into channeled up to your wazoo and sports expenses. Yep. Just mm -hmm. watch the sport that you like. The catch 22 is what you don't see. You're not interested in, in, in doing mm -hmm. like you're not interested in, in, right. in a sport you're interested because you saw it and right. or you know somebody that that practices it and mm -hmm. you go locally you like it locally it's free and you can watch the football uh game between uh you know two two uh, schools at a entry level and but this is the catch-22 at one point who's going to be interested in hockey if you have to only have the nhl channel and they don't show any hockey. Like, no, and, and, you know, when it comes to hockey, the only way I've been able to uh, enjoy it is by going to the pub to watch a game or going yeah. to an, uh, us. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, it's because I, I haven't had cable for 14 years, going on 14 years now. I got rid of it. I just have some streaming services and I can get local channels with a set of rabbit ears, right? But yeah. the barrier to entry, it's like if I want to watch CFL football, of which I'm a fan, I'm an Ottawa mm -hmm. Red Blacks. Uh, I was a season ticket holder for from day one. I pandemic came along and that changed everything. But um, I, I, I also find that if I want to watch a Red Blacks game, I need a subscription to TSN. Well, it's $30 a month. I'm simply not paying that. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to the pub to watch the game or I'll go to a local game if I'm in town, right? And when it comes to uh, other other things like a barricade to uh, to watching uh, Major League Baseball. I have to get a TSN package or a, a Rogers Sportsnet package. If I want to watch hockey, I need to get an, a, a package. And again, I'm yeah. not spending the money on it. And why Miss Shattuck says it's it's why pirating is coming back full force because the <laughs> entry level just to watch a sport now, just to watch a sport, is getting yeah. to be prohibitively expensive. Here in Ottawa, I can turn on the CBC on a Saturday night to watch hockey night in Canada. And unless the Leafs are playing the Sens, I will not see a Sens game. I will see a Leafs game because Rogers Sportsnet has the broadcast rights. And I remember when they first signed the deal, they tried to say, this is a good deal for Canadians. And I'm like, no, it no, isn't. It's not. It's not. It's a no. good deal for shareholders, but not for the average Canadian. Somebody like yeah. me who wants to watch a Sens game on Saturday night. Well, I got to go to the pub because I can't afford to have a $30 extra a month just to watch one thing. Yeah. It's not reasonable. Right now, that being said, I did have to pay a sign up for one month so I could watch the Grey Cup. Because I'm a CFL football fan. So I signed up for okay. one month and then I canceled it. But it was like 30 bucks to watch the Grey Cup is what it cost me. Jeez. You know. Yeah. But that, that. Oh, 
Did we lose Lorraine? Hockey, like locally, there's far less than there used to be to that sport. There's also a lot of competition. Like, oh, yeah. there's well, so the, many other sports you can practice. But the area, the entry level is a barrier for the money involved, right? Because to yeah, get into exactly. it, like just to play rec hockey, local house league is expensive. Let's add in um, the additional ice time for practice. Let's add in the equipment cost. Let's add in the travel cost. Tournaments. Tournaments. Out of town tournaments. Well, you got a yeah. hotel and you're just house league. You're not even competitive. If you get up into to, to competitive or rep or triple A, watch out. Now yeah. you're really paying money. Yeah. I'm a curler and just go to just to go to like a local curling bond spiel. Like some of them are like four hundred and sixty dollars per team just to Jeez. register. Yeah. Yeah. Like you know, oh, you, split it, you split it four ways, but that's still it's like a hundred and fifteen each to go play three games of curling. It's like I pay about six hundred or seven hundred for the season where I'm playing four times a week. Mm-hmm. Like for something like twenty eight yeah. or thirty two weeks. This and then it's like, hey, let's go to Bondspiel. You get three games guaranteed for one hundred and fifteen dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of expensive. <laughs> there's, there's, I, I think you know, regardless of uh, all the fluctuation <laughs> and and all sports with the level of participation. The most part, I would say the sport that's uh, uh, the biggest sport in Canada is soccer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And participation yeah, right wise, yeah. that's the biggest, most popular sport. All you need is a pair you of shoes. Buy shoes. You know, they give you shorts and a jersey and uh, you, you buy your shoes. And then Shin if you want to play alone, you just have a ball and you can go in any park. Mm-hmm. So right. it's very accessible. That's why it's so popular in many countries. Right. Um, it's, it's, uh, cost effectively, it, it changes, you direct yourself with what you can afford, uh, which sometimes puts golf outside of, and figure skating outside of a lot of people's capability to, oh, yes. to practice, but regardless of the sport, I can tell you one thing to many parents that don't think it's important or don't make the effort to put their children in sports Mm -hmm. lose out substantially. Uh, You know, the whole dynamics of work ethics, uh, teamwork, uh, socializing, um, you get out of learning from failure. Mm. Exactly. Learning that from failure and learning to achieve goals it's, it is so many things that you learn and that you come out with in the workplace. Uh, you know, figure skating is not a game. Hockey's a game. Hockey's yes. fun. You can yeah. suck at hockey and still, still have it. fun. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So it's a game for all levels. Figure skating, if you want to get good at figure skating, the only word that comes to mind is work. Mm-hmm. repetition it's work. over and over it's and work over and over. yeah it's work and you could be elvis stoico kurt browning mm-hmm. with talent coming out of your nostrils you still have to work like a dog to get mm-hmm. to the level of performance and results that these athletes got to you know patrick chan same thing mm-hmm. all 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 the skaters work their butts off to get yeah to the level, regardless of the talent that they have. So when you finish, uh, you know, going through this process that's grinded into you that you don't get nothing for nothing, you don't get nothing for nothing. Mm -hmm. Then this attitude is a work ethic that you bring. First, you're very disciplined. You can't be an athlete and not be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's rigorous, discipline, uh, work ethics. You bring this into your life every day. And I've had one of my employees that was on the uh, national synchro team uh, with the Supreme. She's a doctor today. Um, When she applied to go to McGill, she had to give her curriculum vitae, which is... uh, Her resume. Yeah, her resume. So she gave her resume and they go through interviews. It's not just uh, an academic achievement uh, based mm. selection here. It's they go through personal interviews. Well, what did you think hit 
uh, the interest of the interviewer. He said, oh, you're like, I see you figure skated at a national level. You were on Team Canada and you were presented at Worlds and said, he was interested in her talking about that because academically, a lot of people show up, you know, for med mm. uh, at McGill with high ac academic, uh, <laughs> academic achievements, like <laughs> scores like crazy. She had both, but he was more interested in her experience as an athlete. And I've had some other skaters tell me that when they went for job interviews, that was the most important thing that came out and why they were selected because these people are hired and the employer already knows that they have, you know, an outlook on work ethics that is different from get go from anybody arriving with, you know, more or less specific work uh, experience. So there, the work ethic you get and you tend to, uh, it changes your life and it builds you as a different individual. And that is uh, the best outcome. That's why I find regardless of the level, regardless of the sport, you know, now there's more sports study programs. So at least you can get sports out of school, but some sports you can't get out of school, <laughs> like figure skating. You can be in a sports study program, but it's not the school that offers it like volleyball, basketball, handball, you know, all, all the, uh, the sports that are team oriented uh, like that schools mm. offer those and you can, you know, go through the process of your schooling and get to a very interesting uh, level, uh, even university and college uh, level. But um, sorry about that. It happens. Yeah. Um, that definitely for me um, is, you know, it's, it's been my life. It's made me who I am today. Uh, my parents, uh, if they weren't uh, getting up at five in the morning, bringing me to the rink three times a week, early mornings, and I was skating Monday, Tuesday, Thursday morning, Thursday night. Friday night, Saturday morning, you know, this is uh, 15 hour weeks that I spent on the ice to uh, get to uh, the level of uh, skating skills that I have today. And all that effort uh, I bring with me in everything I do. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, yep. that's something that maybe some parents don't take seriously enough. Oh, it's just sports. Mm -hmm. It's sports but it, there's a lot more to it than that. If, if I could ask, uh, because you've been very generous with your time, um, as we're closing up, um, what is something, because it's International Women's Day, what is the best thing that you think that parents could do and that our sports organizations could do to actively encourage young girls and even not just young girls, even like adults to get active again, but young girls to participate in organized sports and people who are older to actually, you know, take up some sports. So like Bridget, she was talking about you know, wanting to pick up hockey at age 30. You know, yeah. there's, there's a lot to, you know, even if you're not going to compete at an Olympic level or you're starting a sport later in life, like four years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to play tennis. I'm not going to Wimbledon. I'm already <laughs> 50. It's not going to happen for me. <laughs> Right. But I yeah. still want to get better and I'm getting stuff at it. Right. You know, there's, there's strategy, yeah. there's, you know, there's, there's, there's different things, you know, there's general overall health and whatnot, but f what could parents, what, what would you recommend for parents doing and what would you recommend that our sports bodies do to try and help uh, encourage greater participation? Well, for parents, um, the first thing would be to choose, you know, the sport that, you can afford um, and choose an activity that the child chooses an activity. Like they'll, they'll start off. My niece started off with dancing and then she moved on to something else. She wanted to do gymnastics. After that, she came to figure skating. So you try out a couple of little activities, but you have to focus the emphasis on choose one thing. You have to choose one thing like we had to choose one thing. My parent wasn't, my parents were not just going to let me like uh, 
not do anything at home. I needed to be invested. So choose something. You have to choose something. Whatever you choose, you're going to do it for a year and you can't quit. That that was essentially my... So once you get involved, you taste one type of activity. Then you taste another type of activity. And at one point, one activity will stick. And if it's not done by the parents to create this uh, way of life, a healthy way of life is to be active. Um, you know, we've had all sorts of associations uh, in Quebec wanting to uh, move activities, uh, get active, blah, blah, blah. But uh, if it doesn't, if you don't have a parent bringing you to the gym or a parent, you know, bringing you to the ice uh, surface or the ice rink in, on Saturday mornings, it's kind of hard for the kids to do that. So if that's not available, then the other option is school. And schools, some schools are not really uh, developed for, you know, doing organized. You have to organize it and structure it. And a lot of schools are not really structured for that. And they've, you know, uh, they kind of pulled away from offering um, all the uh, gym, the, the gym sessions are cut down. Everything's cut down for, for physical activity. So y you kind of don't get involved because of it as a girl. If, if you have an organized activity and everybody's playing a sport and all your friends are there, you're going to go. It's going to be fun, you know? And you create this, this thing out of a young age. It's, uh, it's harder when you're 30, you don't know how to skate, you, you, you don't know how to you know, maneuver a puck and, and you start hockey, but the structure's there for you. You can get into a league that is your level. You, if there was only, uh, uh, let's say, elite AAA level available, mm. then you wouldn't practice sports because you wouldn't be able to play at that level. So if the structure is there, the opportunity is there, then it's a question of choice at that point when you're an adult. But when you're a young child and you are built into participating into a sport all the time, at one point you'll fall in love with one thing. And then you will pursue this activity. But if you're not, you know, like you're never, uh, uh, you never played volleyball till you're in secondary four uh, and then you love it, but you never did sports or you, you won't hook onto it. You, and then you develop uh, self-confidence. You're good at something. Uh, you have fun at something. There's a lot of things that develop, but the structure has to be there. You create the opportunity. A bit like luck, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it, preparation meets opportunity. So, you know, if, if you're at school, you're prepared to do an activity, the activity has to be there for you to be able to, to get into it. And you will fall into an activity sometimes by pure luck. You're going to meet somebody, you're going to do something once and you're going to love it. And then it hooks with you and you, it becomes a part of your life. Mm -hmm. You look yeah. at Tiger Woods. <laughs> Yeah. At the age of two, hitting the golf ball. Right. If his parents didn't, you know, put a club in his hands, uh, he was given the opportunity. He fell in love with the sport and he became yeah. the best golfer in the world in yeah. the process. Mm -hmm. So that that's the only uh, people have to create opportunities, structures that people can invest themselves in and have a chance to participate in any type of sport. I do. In the schooling I agree. system. We're throwing a lot of responsibility on the schooling system, but yeah. I think that uh, they pick up all the slack for parenting sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's true. Yeah. They pick up the slack for a lot of parenting sometimes, and that would be the best way to at least get somebody hooked at elementary level and then high school level into a, a sport and fall in love with it. Mm, right. Lauren, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. This has been wonderful. It's been a totally it was unexpected really fun treat. It was a delight. It's a nice conversation. I loved it. Yes. It was yeah. great. I learned a lot. There's a lot of things I didn't know. Like, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a sports fan, but I yes, you I, are. You knew a lot about figure skating. I'm, I was very impressed. Big fan of figure skating. 
Uh, <laughs> but like where most people will watch the big four ba- basketball, soccer, hockey, and football, because my jam is all the Olympic sports. Okay. I've always been like a big fan of all the Olympic sports. Like my dream. It's like, had I been in a family young enough and that had the financial means and had I been aware of sports because as a kid, I was very, very bad at sports. I was a dancer, so I was athletic, but I was terrible at sports. Um, you know, uh, but like throughout my life, it's like, oh, competitive swimming. Yeah, let's try that. Competitive curling. Hey, let's try that. Now I'm picking up tennis and there's a whole bunch of sports that, that I would really like, but I was always drawn to the, uh, to the Olympic sports. And I remember when I saw my first Olympics, it was 1984. Oh. Because I was born in 73, so 76, I was too young to remember. 80, and then 80, 80 had the boycott. Yeah. So it was like 84, and I'm watching Los Angeles. And because there was the boycott the other way, well, Canada won a whole bunch of medals, right? You got yeah. Sylvie Bernier in diving, right? won, won the yeah. gold, why not? Because every, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I remember, like, I, I'm watching that and I'm like, oh my God. We're really good at this stuff, like, <laughs> and like, and from that moment, I'd always wanted to go to an like wanted to go to an Olympics. But it was eighty four. Yeah. I was already eleven. Most people who go to Olympics have already started the sports that they're going to be at the Olympics yes. at already. Yeah. Right? yeah. So like the, that that moment was past. Had I maybe had a chance to see the Olympics when I was five or six, I maybe would have gotten to something a little earlier. But. Um, my dream vacation, I still haven't done it yet, is to go see an Olympics in person, which is why I asked you if you had gone. Because well, it's Paris. Is I don't care out. where in the world it is. Like this, I just want yeah. to go. To, like I, I've been to Wimbledon. Mm-hmm. I've been to the French oh. Open. Like this, I've gone to the Canadian Figure Skating Championships. I've gone to the Briar. And like I wow. will go see it like, when the World Cup was here. Here I went. Uh, I went to go see uh, Norway play the UK. I went to the Pan Am Games. Like I've, you know, like. I really love that. It's really fantastic, but I really just want to go to an Olympics and like just see what it's like. I even went to the Olympic Park and tried luge, <laughs> right in Calgary. Are you serious? Yes, I tried it. Like because we went to for the bob because we knew that you could do bobsleigh, right? Yeah, and they could take it down on the run. But on the day we went, it happened to be the same day that the Canadian National Luge Championships were on. So I actually like, oh, met wow. Jeff Christie, and they were there, and they said, "No, it's not bobsleigh today. It's luge." It's like, okay, let's try it. It's scary as hell. Yeah. <laughs> I was a human pinball on the last run. Were you a you were were you on a sled with somebody like two man luge or was it your no single? single. Oh, but yeah. what they do what they do is they they give you five runs and they start you at like at the training because there's mm. three starts the on, on level, a loose yeah. track yeah so they start you at the, at the training start and like this and the, all they do is like they make you sit down the, lie down on it and they literally like just take the finger and they like they push you <laughs> over <laughs> just like that and then you go. <laughs> And and then you do two or two runs like that, and then they bring you to the junior start, and they, they do the same thing, and like the Olympic level medalists, and there's a women's start and there's there's, there's the men's start, and they start from the men's start and they go all the way down that track in like in about fifty two seconds, wow. and us from the junior track all the way down was about fifty five seconds, <laughs> and they tell you on luge when you're going to hit the sides, it's the opposite of driving. Cause when you drive, you're about to go off the road, you go the other way. But in luge, when you hit the side, you're supposed to lean into the side that you've hit in and then slowly bring yourself back. Because if you turn, all you do there, you hit, is the, hit the other yeah, side you and you become pinball. this human pinball going down. <laughs> I experienced that once. It is not fun. And there's nothing to hold on to on the bottom of the luge. You just got your hand. So like I'm sitting there going, ah, and you can't lift your head up because the wind comes and throws you off the luge. As we saw at the Vancouver Olympics, the, the athlete from uh, from Georgia, uh, Georgia that Oof. went in the training run that went flying off his luge and unfortunately died. Yeah. Um, so it's like so you can't lift your head up. So you're like you're, you got your head back and you're like look, looking down your nose and it's just the angle that makes you see the tracks. But you're going boom, boom, boom. And so oh god, I want to I wanna get <laughs> off this ride. I want to get off this ride. <laughs> so <laughs> sports for me, this is a particular treat because talking about somebody who's gotten to work with the athletes that understand sports and because like you said it's a gliding sport so it applies to cross-country skiing and you know we, we didn't even get into short track and long track specifically in talking yeah. about the you know the differences um I'm a very, very happy beaver right now <laughs> this, I know it's International Women's Day but this was very much a treat for me. 
Yeah. So, uh, I, oh, I, I respect your knowledge and uh, yeah. thank you. Now, like you were saying, uh, do you know how the impact I see that the Olympics had on you as oh. a motivation source? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I still be, have a dream. I still hope to make it in curling one day. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be sad if the Olympics came to be exclusively on some channels? That would be terrible. That's my, it really would my be. ending quote because it might get there. Yeah. But yeah. that's what's watching the Olympics in 84 yeah. that made me want to try sports and any type of sports, like exactly. made me want to be good at sports because I had just given up on them. Yeah. Because, and actually want to go, like I've actually, you know, in certain sports, it's going to sound more impressive than it is, but I actually went to the National Open Water Swim Championships. Oh. I competed nice. like this when I was a swimmer like this. Now, I didn't have to qualify. <laughs> so <laughs> I did not finish last. Uh, because, but, but I, you know, but we were swimming in the, uh, you know, and I went to the, the, the Traversée du Lac Mefray Magog. Oh, uh, not Mefray mm. not, not Magog, Magog. Like oh, this. wait. I did, I, and I didn't do the, yeah, exactly. And I didn't do the Traversée, but they, they had a, a 1K, 2K, 5K, and 10K event. Okay. Like this. So, and I did that. But it was, so it, like, it always sounds, Impressive. I went to a national championship. Well, yes, I did realize my dream of going to a national championships in the sport because That's I didn't cool. have to qualify. <laughs> but I also got to in '94 go to the Gay Games in New York City, which is wow. so. And that one was like, you know, that that feeling that athletes say they get at the opening ceremonies. Yes, we had an opening ceremonies, and you know, they were at the Met Stadium, and the closing ceremonies was at Yankee Stadium, and we were all like by country, and we had our outfits and our uniform, and there was a person that was like Canada, and they walk in, and everybody is like yelling, ah, and TSN had actually showed up because they had a series called For the Love of the Game back then. I actually got interviewed because I had my medals from my swimming competition, you know, and it was just cool. like. Ah, this is so much fun. This is what it feels like. I was like, that's the closest to the Olympics I ever got, right? And that I will ever get. But walking into that stadium, and it's like, and there's like Yankee Stadium is big. Yeah. And all mm -hmm. these people who do not know you are cheering for you just because wow. you just because you walked in. It's one hell of a drug. Oh, I could, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. There's nothing artificial that can replace that feeling. Oh, right? no. You're just like walking in Canada. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. like yeah it's it's those are memorable like said, times They're I, gonna... listen, I, I could get alzheimer's and i will remember that moment oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah 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 it's <laughs> seared into my brain oh it's, it's really yeah. cool yeah so you can gain a lot and i wanted to show you something oh <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I played hockey for two years, yeah. and I was terrible at it. <laughs> so you zero goals, a zero fingers? assists, two two penalty minutes because I didn't know how to stop, and I ran into someone. <laughs> and then okay. I went to the penalty box, and I cried because <laughs> I didn't read or heard them. Because, so you bought yourself skates, a pair of Jackson skates? Yes, because, but hockey skates always hurt my ankles. Okay. And because I'm a dancer... Mm. Right, dancer shoes. You always buy two sizes smaller than your actual feet, so they mm -hmm. mold to your feet. So I thought, what about figure skates? I do not know how to do any tricks with these, and I would so love to learn. But I love these skates. No, you have rice sports. Nice. Yes, I yeah. love these skates. Yeah, I they saw are the that. most comfortable skates I I've have never ever had in my entire life. And I just want to, I, I don't want to jump because I got bad knees, but I want to learn how to spin something fierce. <laughs> so funny <laughs> because story. Because that was the funnest thing in dancing. I loved to spin, but you could only spin, you, you could like a, do a triple or a quad at the most, or if you can do the leg whip, you can do more, but that's it. But with skating, like you could just spin and spin and spin, and I don't get dizzy, and I really want to learn how to spin. <laughs> well, that, that's the reason why I have Stoico. these. Take some lessons. <laughs> that was Elvis Stoico, though. He just told his parents he wanted to spin, so they got him into figure skating. And look at age that. five in the living room. Yep, he wanted at to spin. The age five in the living room, he wanted to spin at age five. So, yeah. yep. I mean, so some people are destined, you know. And I, I tell you, funny I story. did not have the bottom pick shaved off. That's that good because you need those. Without those, okay. you can't do all the tricks. Yeah. Topic. But, 
But hey, hey, well, that's exactly it. That's the first thing I learned is like, you really have to lift your foot off the mm-hmm. ice because of the number of times I went down face first, getting yeah. used to that toe pick, just while having the, the lazy foot. Mm-hmm. So I did really lift it high because with hockey skates, you don't have to. And it's like, oh, okay. Like this. And I remember I was on the Rito Canal and so all of a sudden I got some speed going. I was like, okay, yeah, this is great. Ah. <laughs> you go down real fast <laughs> and hard. I was in Paris a bunch of years ago uh, between Christmas and New Year's. And I was there for New Year's Eve. And we were at the Eiffel Tower. And on, you know, there's three levels to the Eiffel Tower. If you've, if you've never been, there's the, the, the lowest level where there's a restaurant and there's a cafe and there's a cafeteria mm-hmm. and there's, and there's a skating rink in the wintertime. They have a rink. And so you can go and skate on the Eiffel Tower. Oh, wow. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. let's do that. And, um, I get up to them and I'm like, uh, yeah, men's skates. And they handed me figure skates. And I went, uh, no, I'm out. I'm out. And they looked at me and the, the person I was with was like, what's the matter? And I go, I've never worn figure skates in my life. I'm Canadian. If I put them on, they know I'm Canadian. I'm a dumb Anglophone in Paris and I skate and I fall flat on my face. They're going to take my passport away from me and banish <laughs> me to Siberia. I've never skated in figure skates, so I'm not about to attempt it on the Eiffel Tower. I'll look like an idiot. I will embarrass my country. And she just looks at me and she goes, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, yeah, okay. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, happy International oh, Women's Day. Well, thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Paul. Thank you it for was, spending uh, so much time with us. It's, it was a pleasure. Yeah. And if um, any day you have anything else to say, please come back. We'd love to have you back well, again. And and well, while we have you here, now. we have you as a as a we have a captive audience. We've got about somewhere around nine hundred people watching live right now, and there'll be more as the day goes on. What is the name of your store, and where can they find it? Yes, uh, l'artiste du patin. L'artiste du patin. L'artiste du patin in Brassard on the okay. South Shore, of Montreal, mm-hmm. and um, I've had the business for thirty seven years, and. Um, We're highly specialized in uh, everything that has to do with uh, skates, hockey skates also we sell, Mm -hmm. not only figure skates. And you teach power skating too, correct? Yeah, yeah. Which is funny when you watch big burly six foot four hockey players get pushed over and they they (laughs) can't move you, right? (laughs) Well, it's been, uh, I can say that a lot of NHLers uh, would benefit from taking... uh, Mm-hmm. lessons and paying more attention to their skating skills because uh, mm-hmm. they can't skate backwards a lot of them mm-hmm. and they can't cross cut well either mm-hmm. even forwards mm-hmm. they're jumping all over the place and they're not very smooth well, what was it and, Wayne Gretzky uh, said about uh, uh, Sidney Crosby he said Wayne Gretzky actually said before Sidney Crosby got in the NHL because Sidney Crosby took figure skating and power skating when he was very young Wayne Gretzky said Wow, that kid can skate. If I could have skated like him, I really could have yeah. been something. <laughs> he actually said that. And everybody was like, what? He goes, well, well, if I could have skated like that, I really would. I would have set some great records. I'm like, dude, your records are untouchable. Yeah, but he, outside of his uh, genius for the game, mm-hmm. the way the game is played, mm-hmm. um, visionary, mm-hmm. visionary uh, hockey player, which uh, a lot of people are don't see ahead and and can't really position themselves according to a potential uh, outcome in a mm-hmm. game. He was uh, the master of that, but he wasn't the best skater. And he's no, right. That. He's right. He wasn't. Yeah. He didn't have a great he, shot. He didn't have a slap shot, yeah. a wrist shot. Yeah. Uh, he was not a great skater, but he had vision. He knew where yeah. to be, skate he, to where the He was always be. where he needed to be when yep. he needed to be there. And yep. that was his, his, uh, his and, gift. Oh, yeah. And his yep. talent was really mm-hmm. that, but he wasn't a, the greatest skater. No, no. Technically, uh, no. And there are a lot yeah. in the NHL that are pretty much in the same predicament. <laughs> well, and then I look at somebody like Connor McDavid, who is not only the fastest skater I've ever seen in professional hockey, but he's so fluid. Mm. Like uh, they used to say about Paul Coffey, the only man who accelerates as he glides, because they were yeah. both very good skaters. And Connor McDavid is probably the best skater in the NHL right now. And I don't think it's even close. And when he gets the puck and takes off, good night. 
He reminds me of Bobby Orr. Remember Bobby Orr would get the puck in his zone, go yeah. end to end through the whole team, make them look yeah. like pylons and then score yeah. a goal. Yeah. yeah. There's a, um, technically there's a thing that makes you say that somebody's uh, fluid on the ice. Mm -hmm. Hockey has always been what I taught uh, and explained to hockey players is you cannot maneuver the puck well if what you're doing below with your legs is disturbing what you're trying to do on the upper mm -hmm. body. So the right. lower body has to skate. The upper body has to play hockey. Right. So where we get into the problem is that everything you do, uh, how you skate, if you don't do it well and in the proper angle, yep. you have the action reaction physics mm -hmm. that kind of disturb the whole upper body. Yep. Oh, yeah. And then you are not fluid. You cannot be fluid with the puck. Yep. You and want a stable and smooth platform. Exactly. So that is the, the technically the mechanics um, of everything that's done on an ice surface is in relation to executing the pushes in the proper angle, according to where you are, either you're starting, you're accelerating or you're skating. But a lot of hockey stays in the start and acceleration mode, but they mm -hmm. never get into a skating mode. So they don't go into the third speed, which is skating techniques. They stay in acceleration they do stop and starts, stop and, you know, they're all over the place, but they never get into the technique of skating. And so that's why there's, there's a high velocity of repetitions and stepping at a high speed frequency to, to optimize speed, but they never get into the third mode, which is change your angle, let's push, and then less frequent, and then you continue accelerating. And I, I've worked with a lot of skaters and what I find is they can't cross cut properly. So each time they, they don't undercut in the proper angle, their upper body torques, and then they yep. can't maneuver the puck. Yep. So it's, it's not normal when you're in an NHL player and we're practicing forward cross cuts and you can't cross cut and drag the puck. They keep mm -hmm. losing the puck left and yep. right. Yeah. And, and, and there are people who are already signed or either, you know, I, I these are hockey agency skaters. So they're already signed, you know, hockey players and they can't cross guard and just, you know, smoothly transport the puck. They always have to maneuver their jerking upper bodies jerking when it shouldn't be. So technically the fluidity that you get and that you recognize on a, on a NHL -er has everything to do with the proper techniques of execution when it comes to, Standard pushing and cross cutting and turning, it's not done properly. So it disturbs the upper body. So mm -hmm. you're going to see them jerky instead of being fluid. So, Douglas, you're a dancer. Mm -hmm. It's like dancing Latin. Your upper body doesn't move, it's the yep. lower body that does the steps. Yep. Well, it's the same thing. It, that's my analogy. It's the yep. same thing. So you manage to cut off the upper body that's playing hockey and then the lower body that's skating. Yep. Yeah. So that that's the fluidity that you refer to, the, the quality of those skaters. That's what they achieved mm -hmm. or brought to their skating skills, that quality. So that explains the fluidity. Yep. I noticed, yeah, you're right in dance like this, you know, while everything's going on down, downstairs like this. The shoulders are stable and level. Mm -hmm. The shoulders yeah. are not popping up and down or like, yeah. this. like all of this is there. And like this, you could be like swimming like a duck below the waist, but this. Exactly. It's like Highland dancing or, or Irish step dancing. You know, yeah. everything below yeah. the waist is going bananas, but everything above yeah. it doesn't move. So what, yep. what you have uh, is a lot of hockey players that can't like backwards start well. Mm. Uh, they can't backwards skate. They don't have their weight on the pushing leg. They're all yep. they're all mismanaged uh, in their technique. So they have to compensate by doing an excessive amount of pushing steps that are not productive enough to generate the speed the, that they're looking for. So you know, there's all these things that you know. I had somebody that was uh, was playing for the American League for Chicago, and he was a defenseman. 
And I, I spent the week trying to make him understand that, you know, and making exercises to shift his weight on, the, on to get the power on the pushing leg is basically you have to have your weight over the pushing leg to be able to generate power. But he always had his weight on the gliding leg and he was shifting inappropriately. And that's how he learned how to play, uh, to, to skate backwards all his life. And it was very hard to just change this very refined detail that would generate twice the power on the same push. And those are things that, you know, I find that I see a lot in the NHL. There's a lot of cross cuts that are not, you know, mastered. And it's not that I want to excuse, you know, the fact that hockey players don't only need to know how to skate, but mobility on the ice is key. Mm -hmm. And um, the level of difficulty technically that a hockey player needs to refine their skating skills is very basic because mm. the level of, of technical skills that is uh, required is learned in, in the six badges of the figure skating program mm. for right. toddlers that are beginners. Right. You know, it's skating forwards, skating backwards, cross cutting forwards, cross cutting backwards, mastering turns that they decided to take the name away because it was inappropriate, which was called the Mohawk turn. Mm -hmm. uh, so yep. all the pivots, the two foot pivots, uh, uh, you know, the breast turns, the, the only thing they don't learn are takeoffs and backward takeoffs, forward takeoffs and backward takeoffs, uh, technically mm -hmm. that are not shown in figure skating because you don't need a forward and backward start, explosive start and figure skating. Yeah. All you need is to glide and figure skating. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they all that basics that is, I, I don't comprehend why you're in NHL level and you still can't do proper backward cross cuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, well, the, that's I don't think they teach it in hockey anymore because when I, like I could, I was on skates, I think as soon as I could walk. And I'm not joking when I say that. Uh, we lived in Cold Lake, Alberta at the time. So I was walking. They had me on bob skates out on the ice. I've been playing hockey, uh, organized hockey. I started when I was five or six. I can't quite recall. And one of the fundamentals they taught us was skating back then. They don't teach that in hockey anymore. Now they expect you to take a separate course. Well, not everybody can afford to do that. Right. So one of the most natural, like two of my, one of my, my favorite thing in the world to do is ski. If I could ski every day of my life, I would. And in the winter, living here in Ottawa, unfortunately this year and last year it was not good, but I would go out on the canal and spend six, seven, eight hours just skating. And I'd go and meet some friends and I'd hang out with them for a few minutes and then I'd just take off. Because there's something about being alone on the ice by yourself with the longest rink in the world yeah. to just skate freely with nobody to interrupt you you have not not a care in the world i just felt so fluid and natural and free and alive which is why the last two seasons we, we were open for 10 days this year but the canal only sections of it and it was terrible the rink of dreams up the street uh, from the city hall is there and i might put the skates on on sunday and go out for a little bit but it's not it's not the same as having that freedom to skate you know like a river or a lake or yeah. in my case the canal it's not the same. And when I'm out there, it feels the closest uh, experience I can get to skiing because the, the, a lot of the motion is very similar for me. Yeah, right? it is. Hips and knees. And, and there's yep. the gliding aspect of it and the Changing the absolute of direction freedom. is the same also? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just feels so natural to me to do it. It's because I've been doing it my whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't get skiing this year because the season was, well... <laughs> The only way I was going to go is if I, if I went to yeah, Europe, it was yeah. really non-existent. I know I had some friends who went out and said they went out a couple of times and it was good, but you really had to, it was a luck of the draw. So this season and last season for skiing, I only got out five times last year. I bought new gear for last season and this season, and I didn't get out once this year. And unless I head down to South America this summer, it isn't going to happen in 2024, I'm afraid. So yeah. It's a bummer that the, the two things that I love the most when it comes to sports, and I'm a hockey player. I was a goalie for, for decades, but, but skating, just skating on a, on the canal, just, just the freedom of it. Same thing. Yeah, with you downhill feel skiing. Free. It's you the feel freedom free. of it. Yeah. There's no barriers, no barricades, yeah. no nothing. And you can go as fast as you want or as slow as you yeah. want. You can take your time and you're not holding anybody else up. 
Like you're not in anybody's way. And I think that's what about it for me. Like if you're out on a cross country ski trail and there's a lot of people. Yeah. You're stuck behind people. Yeah. Or in front and slowing them, you know, you're, <laughs> but going down a mountain or going yeah. up and down the canal, mm -hmm. it's just you and you're only competing against yourself, which is, I think is why a lot of people enjoy running because it's the same thing. It's the freedom. As a goaltender, my knees don't like running <laughs> and I want to be able to save them for skating and skiing. So I'm not really much of a runner. I will get on my bike, but there's a whole different reason why I don't spend too much time on it because the uh, seat and, and men and what it can do to men, uh, you know, let's, let's, you know, from a men's health perspective, bicycle seats for a long time period is bad for you. Mm-hmm. And I don't want. Well, they're know. not comfortable to begin with. So. No, they're not. Yes. They're not. And and they have detrimental aspects that I just don't want to. Uh, yeah. Have to address at my age. I've I might seen. have to in twenty years, but I'm hoping I don't. But right now, I don't have to. So why why make it that way? I've never exactly. understood why bicycle seats don't come with extra padding as a standard feature. Mm. Just no. <laughs> yeah, and just, even just, when they're padded, if you're. For a long, no, yeah. after an hour or so, uh, yeah, even exactly. if they're padded, <laughs> yeah. it's not fun. <laughs> anyway, that was my little diatribe. But uh, what, Lorraine, thank you very much for being so generous with your time. This was uh, my pleasure. Illuminating, enlightening, and of course, being that it's International Women's Day, I thought somebody who has you know a business owner who has, has helped our, right. our country at an international level uh, and teaches people uh, daily is is somebody we need to celebrate more often not just once a year on this particular day oh and by the way you know there's because it's a leap year fellas if you're butt hurt about women getting a day today you still get 365 because there's 366 in the calendar you, get an extra day. you got a bonus day too this year yeah, yeah so so you know calmez-vous le pompon Ouais, ouais, ouais. On se calme, on se calme. <rire> J'aime bien ton français, Douglas. Ah, merci vraiment. beaucoup. Oui. Un petit franco ontarien. Oui, c'est beau. Oui. Ça. Merci beaucoup. Ah, I love That's it. Good. That makes me so happy. Merci beaucoup. <rire> merci beaucoup, Paul. Oh, It was really brilliant. enjoyable. Thank you. You guys right. are two great guys. <rire> <rire> All right. Remember to remember to like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, I I will actually. I, I'll I'll keep up and uh, I'll, I'll check out what you guys are up to. Oh, share us with all your friends too, yes. if they find uh, a political talk interesting. Uh, we're not just politics. The show Monday to Friday it's is culture. Yeah, it's primarily okay. politics, but it's and general culture. And once a month, we do a thing called the Pubcast, where normally we just go over here across the street from my apartment to a place called the Lieutenant's Pump in beautiful downtown Ottawa. And we'll sit there on a Saturday afternoon and just talk about life. And it, we don't talk politics during the podcast. One. It's no politics. That's the rule. Every now and then okay. it'll lean in a little bit, but we try and steer out of it as quickly as possible because we want it just to be a place where we can sit and enjoy a pint and enjoy our, an afternoon. Enjoy now, each other's this, company. And and exactly. Other an afternoon people, of right? That politics is not your entire identity. It, and it's not ours, right? So once a month we do that. And this month is a little bit different because scheduling wise, the only time that Douglas is available and myself, because tomorrow I'm just not well enough to, to be in a pub because I'm still trying to get over a bronchial infection. But we're doing it on March 16th uh, this year. Now we won't be in the pub. It will be virtual because of the fact that March 17th, which is a Sunday, which is St. Patrick's Day, means that yeah. the Saturday will be, forget about it. Forget about it. No, no. There's no way we could, we It'll couldn't be reserve a session. It'll be International Pub Day. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So we're going to do it yes. virtually. I'll change the background to make it look like we're in the pub. Douglas is going to do the same on his end, and we'll have a bunch of people. We've got some friends that are going to join us uh, remote uh, for that day. If you want to join us, it, it'll be, we're going to start around, um, I know Douglas is going to join at four. Because yeah, I'm in rehearsal till three. Yeah, I might I might start at around three ish if I can get things organized on my end. Ish, I say ish because mm, there's no setup this time because the studio's here. But it'll depend because I'm going to spend a little bit of time in the pub in the afternoon because after all, it is the St. Patrick's Day weekend. And as a good Irishman should, you should raise raise a point again as to to the feast of St. Patrick, is he? So yes. if you want to join us on the 16th, sometime around 4 p.m. on our YouTube channel, we'll be there to broadcast our monthly pubcast. Oh, it'd be That'd lovely be to have you if you could. I'll check it out. All right. Take care, you guys. All right. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Oh yay! I love that. I love that so much. What a surprise! I had kids. I had no idea this was happening. Mm -hmm. I had a, like a whole show on the State of the Union. 
<laughs> dressed up Biden did last night planned and then it's sort of like oh we have a guest Yay. well I thought International Women's Day let's bring in somebody who is a good represent uh, representative of, of women because she's a woman but also a business leader uh, uh, an expert in her field and you know how much we love expertise in this show so I, I, yeah and, and it, it you were kind of like what's going on <laughs> <laughs> but you were your charming self and immediately i knew you i knew you'd like her right away and i knew that you guys would connect Jeez, and fabulous. enjoy it i know i know i know i want to take lessons from her <laughs> well, i really do i'll connect with her because i don't like i'm everything that she said about hockey the the you know the the starts and putting all the energy in the push and whatnot because i have good balance like this but i've never learned how to cross cut i never learned how to actually uh, like you know push to the side and stop I've never, you know, all, all those things that she was mentioning, all those skating skills, you know, I, I just know how to stay upright and not fall because I have really, really good balance because then I can weight transfer from side to side, but, you know, flipping edges or, you know, cross cutting, skating backwards while cross cutting. I know none of that. And I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to skate better. Well, it's, it's, it's like anything. It takes, uh, time, dedication, practice, a mm -hmm. lot of practice. And remember, remember the thing, you know, people always say practice makes perfect. I hate that statement. Perfection doesn't exist. And who would want it to? How boring the world would be if everything was perfect. Everything would be bland, vanilla, mayonnaise. Actually, let's take vanilla out of there because vanilla is lovely. It would be mayonnaise without any sort of flavor. <laughs> Not aioli. <laughs> exactly. Oh, um, yeah. Saucy said, has a comment here. Uh, I'm not sure if Mar Marianne is still doing the Let's Take This Outside yes, podcast. Yeah, but, I just, uh, I just yeah that Lorraine might be a great, a great, great guest for Marianne. I just reached right. out to her. I sent her a message and I'm going to try and connect them together. So, because Marianne, I think, would love to interview her for sure. Oh, I'm yeah. Right up Marianne's. Uh, well, she loves to cross country ski, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like she does it a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah, so no, I, I just sent a message to Marianne. Hopefully she can uh, reach out to me and we can connect Lorraine with Marianne and, and yeah, we can make something oh. happen. Oh, well, thank you, Bridget. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Bridget just posted, sorry for people listening at home. I keep on forgetting sometimes. That we yeah, I know. This goes on podcast only. Uh, uh, Mademoiselle Fox posted, Lorraine is my friend's auntie. So I'm guessing that uh, Lorraine comes to us courtesy of Bridget. Yes, uh, last night, um, her friend uh, said uh, we were we were talking away, and and uh, Bridget said I think she'd be amazing for the show, and I said, well, what's what? Tell me about her. So he I told me a few things. Ass, Bridget. Told me a few things, and then he called her, and I spoke with her on the phone for about ten or fifteen minutes, and I said, okay, I'll send you a link around six thirty tomorrow morning. We go live around seven ish, and we'll start the show, and then Douglas will come in, and and you didn't know anything about this Nothing. until the show began. Yep. Yep. And it turned out really good, didn't it? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like geeking out. She, you guys did a great interview with her and, uh, I, I am. Thank you, Vim. I have to say like, it was my fucking idea. So <laughs> give me some fucking credit. Thank you. Love you <laughs> props, props, props. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thank you. You guys were awesome. I mean, she was incredible, and you were both so respectful to her, and everyone loved the com like the comments are just off the charts. So, but it was a fucking idea. It was your fucking idea. Thank you, Douglas. This you get the credit. <laughs> are we doing a whisper ASMR show right now that I'm not you, aware? Do you get the credit? I'm my idea. This is why Douglas and I are friends. <laughs> Cover your all mic. the love, all the credit. The mic. Mm, oh no, don't. No, no, don't hold the mic. You don't hold the mic. It's on its own arm. I spent money on that for a reason. Okay. So during this part, I, can I can I talk a little bit? Yes, Michael. Go. Thank you. So during this podcast, I took the dog out twice. I was uh, very happy to listen. I didn't want to miss any part of what Lorraine had to say and uh she didn't even tell you uh and I won't no no it's not our story to tell it's not our story to tell but she really helped my friend um in a way that you you if uh, it's not our story to tell so we won't tell it but yeah. um the way she's it'll blow your mind yeah so and we'll leave it at that because it's not our story to tell so we won't tell no. it, but it would blow your mind I'm not telling it no. we'll leave it at that <laughs> 
But anyway, I am a little grumpy this morning. Oh no. I'm a little I'm just tired. Like I'm just we're just tired from the dog. Like would an e hug help? Lola's amazing, but she's she's exhausting. <laughs> she's exhausting, but I just took her so I took her outside and I didn't uh I don't know if you want a story, but um I'm fucking telling it anyway. <laughs> Oh, I, I was like, I just, we need more coffee. And like, I can't even go out of the room without her following me. So I ordered some Tim Hortons coffee and picked it up in the lobby. And um, I ordered some extra coffee for um, Fern, who's the building ma manager here, because he is such a sweet Yeah, he's the property manager. He's a great guy. And um, he... Um, He's been so helpful with, with Lola. So I went in to just say, thank you very much. Like he's, his father is, uh, who's passed is a dog trainer and he, and Fern is from, uh, thank you, Linda. So Fern is from, um, Northern Ontario. He's a, an indigenous person. He's fluently bilingual. He is so smart and kind. And he just like, as soon as I brought we brought Lola in he was just like that's a good girl and he, he just gave me a bunch of tips about dog training so we had a little we we shared some Tim Hortons coffee and donuts in uh, his office donuts yeah well, you don't get the donuts I gave them to uh <laughs> Lola <laughs> them off. and um his one of his uh, associates who works here has like She's a, a really awesome woman. She cleans the building and she loves Lola too. And I was like, hey, Fern, you know, it's International Women's Day. He's like, oh, I didn't know that. That's so cool. I'm like, well, when, um, I can't remember her name right now because I'm, anyway, when, you're, when your associate comes in, um, tell her happy International Women's Day and have some donuts. <laughs> ah, I love donuts. I want donuts. I know. I, know. I, know. I <laughs> wish I kept one. <laughs> uh, oh. How are you celebrating the day, Douglas? Well, we already uh, did. I think. I think we. I, I think I am, crushed uh, it. Yeah, uh, I have a rehearsal tonight mm. for a play that is being directed by a woman. Nice. And Actually, I, both plays I'm in right now are being directed by women. I, Actually, that we will rock you the entire. For director, stage manager, and assistant stage manager is all female team actually. That's amazing. And how long is it on for? Because I know there's a reason I'm asking. Oh, it's on for we're doing ten shows uh, from the 28th of March until the um, I'd say about fifth of April. Awesome. Uh, but they're not every night. I think it's Wednesdays through Wednesdays through Sundays. Okay. And not Mondays and Tuesdays. The reason I'm asking. send you a link. So, oh, please do because, um, and yes, Saucy, absolutely. Donuts are the food of the day or whatever you fucking want to eat. Bacon. Bacon. Donuts. <laughs> the, sausage. The, the reason. Eat all the cake. Things in the chat, in the chat for listeners. It's the eat chat. all the cake. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so here, the, the reason you were asking about the, the play, right? Is because um, Ray Girl. Shout out to Ray Girl. Um, she offered to to pick Paul and I up and drive us to Kingston to see you to see you. Yeah. So. Ah, now you. I, I, I'm just chorus in this one though. That's fine. So you know. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. But we, yes, no, please. it was totally her idea, and I just wanted to shout out to Ray Girl. I know she's getting ready to travel, and she was going to join in, but she's really busy. <laughs> Linda, today is not a day for sausage. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pee my, I'm gonna pee my pants. So, in honor of International Women's Day, I'm gonna hot flash and possibly pee my pants because I've had two children, and sometimes that happens. Yeah. And <laughs> it's not a day for sausage. You, oh it is goodness. not a Tommy fest. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, people in this chat are so hilarious. I can't even. Mm. That's why I pee my pants. So, yes, just to answer your question, uh, March 28th to 28th. April 6th, 
Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday performances have evening performances at 7.30, and then there's a Saturday and Sunday matinee performances both weeks at 2 p.m. Awesome. Can we bring Lola? Right. Just kidding. She cannot go in. <laughs> to no. The theater. I can barely get her out the door. <laughs> no, that's not true. She's such a good girl, but I'm like, she can't be around dogs. She can't be. She, everybody's her it's new take best a while friend. For her to get used to people. Yeah, I mean, she listens to Paul and she listens to me and she listens to Fern. But ooh, she's a handful. Like we're hoping to get her to the dog park, like at some point when there are no dogs there. I'd love to get her out running. Honestly, I love running. I really want to get her out into the forest and just run with her. But uh, we're it's a process, right? Mm -hmm. like, Doesn't happen mm -hmm. overnight. Oh, and by the way, just to add, because um, I was looking again, um, there are, there are no shows, however, on the Easter Sunday. Oh, that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, on and the thirty first. Easter's early this year, right? Yeah, March thirty first. Yeah. Oh, wow. But, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, our uh, our dress rehearsals the twenty seventh, opening night the twenty eighth, and then yeah, four shows that week, and then five shows the following week. Also, there's no such thing as I'm just in the chorus. That's awesome. No, no, th there's no such thing as a small role. That's okay. right. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm... there's no small parts, but yes, I've got. No, it's just because the last time I think you guys came to see me over the river through the you were the star. Yeah. Like yeah. This, I had the lead. Oh my one. gosh! So, so, so yes, but I, I'm chorus on this one. So and you honestly, that was so powerful that performance. Like we both, Paul and I, were both just like crying. Yeah, it was, it was, it's <laughs> the first half is funny. The second half changes things. We're like, wait, I did not see that coming. Nobody yeah. gave me a heads up about this. Yeah, I was I not prepared. You tell I remember you telling me you didn't tell me I was gonna have feelings. <laughs> I was like, no, it was it was really incredible, and I was just like, I love that show. Sorry, oh, when you say you're in the chorus, all I can think of is Bugs Bunny. Oh, we're the boys of the chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. <laughs> That's all I can think of. Okay. All right, let's wrap this up so I can. Uh, I got some work I got to do. I got a meeting in like, oh God, I got a meeting in 10 minutes. And thank you, Saucy. Oh. I'll look into that leash. All right. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do with my State of the Union content. <laughs> well, we can maybe Monday. We can but, we can deal with but it. But there Monday. will be political stuff that happens on the weekend. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll tie that in. We'll tie it in. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, kids and cubs, if you, uh, came here today wondering, you know, because, uh, the state of the union stuff says, oh, I can't wait to see what he's going to say about that cliffhanger. So <laughs> I didn't even know it was on. <laughs> I, I had heard of it a bit, uh, but then we went to go like watch the play last night and then I came home and I was checking my email and like doing some stuff to prepare for today. Like what kind of show do I want to prepare? And there were all these comments while like Joe Biden, oh my God, he knocked it out of the park. He did this, he did that. If you thought he was too old, that's too bad. And like this, he was so wrong. I mean, you even had like people like, and we're talking about like, like Michael Smirkanish and, you know, and who, who's like expressed many times. He's a, a, a big time con commentator in the United States. So like mm. all the pundits and whatnot. And then, then a long parallel to that, it's like, oh my God, what was that? Like just talking mm -hmm. about the person that was given the response. And it's just, and I'm thinking, like, what is this? So I actually st started watching it last night before going to bed, even though we got back home at 11:30, like from the play, because opening night there's a reception, and you know I'm on the board and produced it, so you know I was there for that, and um, that's where um, this uh, little baby came from, uh, the rose that I got for that, um, and uh, and I said, well, I have to see what this is, and I was up until like three. In the morning, watching it all, and I'm thinking, like, and taking time steps and going, like, this is going to be great. And then I walk in and go, there are people here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. A surprise, I know. But, so, you know, International Women's Day, I thought it was no, appropriate. No, absolutely. And... No, this was a great idea. Oh, thank you, sir. I am, thank you. I have oh, no, no, rarely been so welcome. happy. To, I've rarely been so happy to have been thrown off, thrown off schedule. Mm. <laughs> Douglas, you can roll you can roll with anything you're awesome ah, i am a bit of a weed you just like plant me somewhere and i'll thrive there we go <laughs> yeah there are two types of people in the world there are weeds and there and then there are orchids i'm a weed <laughs> Good i'm pretty to know. low maintenance <laughs> well, I, I was told um by somebody that i'm sitting next to that i'm a bit of a princess <laughs> yes that was my paper sweetie 
<laughs> well, I love your beaver, sweetie. She, she, she doesn't so do deny I. that she's a bit of a princess, though. Yes. Neither does Alex. Uh-huh. <laughs> Put your crown on. If daughter, the crown fits, wear daughter. it, right? Today, my oh, queen. Stop mm-hmm. it. For you. There you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's for you. That is really I that you just made my day. Queen Beaver has said so. Let it be so. Let it be so. There you go. <laughs> All righty, let's wrap this up. I got a meeting. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode. Ah, I guess it's not the Daily Beaver Morning Show, but uh, the interview project. Yes, because yes, this yes. is going to be an interview project that's going to go down as this one. Uh, surprise interview project, and I've never been more happy to be surprised. This is wonderful. Um, sharing is caring word of mouth is priceless you have the mouse that we want the words to come out of so please tell all of your peeps and poops about us share this far and wide especially if you know uh, anybody who's into sports especially if you have anybody in your family that you love young girls or even adults mm-hmm. who are into Absolutely. sports like this you know send them the message let them see somebody you know who basically in their field made it to the top levels i mean we're talking about people who coached you know Olympic level players, right? Whatever it is that you're doing in sport, you don't have to be an athlete. You can be a trainer. You can be a coach. When you get to the top levels of your game, that's spectacular. So, um, you know, if you, and like we said, if you don't see it, you can't achieve it. So make, make, make sure that people see this. Um, if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the aforementioned Ray girl. Bon voyage, by the way, happy travels. If you scan that QR code that's, uh, well, not under my chin today because we got a wider shot, but sort of like right under my... Mike, flag. My, yeah, or my... Um, right peck? Yeah, let, let's call it a peck. <clears throat> Cylindio has more than I do. Um, <laughs> you, uh, oh boy. That'll bring you to... Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I'm rather Cylindian-esque over uh, when it comes to pecks in the chest region um you scan that that will bring you to our uh pod page which is podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver with a hyphen between each one of those words lowercase letters lowercase letters and that way when we have something fresh off the bandwidth you do not have to miss it if you'd like to support us in other ways uh, the qr code right up there in the top corner brings you to our youtube page where you can like share and subscribe and uh you know guys we like it when you join but um <clears throat> ladies all yeah, the ladies all the ladies loud and now help me out come on all the ladies subscribe to our show so please because we want you to be there absolutely and if you can help us out in other ways well the squiggling that's now in the top corner because it switched magically Mr. Grizzly uh, makes magic this. happen. Now, if you scan it, it will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. Help us get ready for St. Patrick's Day. We need to practice so that we get the day right. Right? That's how it works, right? Yeah. We're here today because we, we got to get our drinking game on. Just you gotta, you gotta read. You gotta read Sosby's comment. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so I got the private chat there. The National Post won't be very impressed with your tatas, Douglas. How will you take ah take out woke with those flapjacks? Ah, ah. That's a good one, Ray. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> what I lack in volume, I make up with enthusiasm when I shake them. <laughs> hey, National Post, you want some of this? Indeed. Huh? Huh? There you go, huh? <laughs> but yes, the uh, Eager Beaver Lodge, because hey, we just had a national level coach come yes, over here. We, did. Like, we, ha- we have to be in training for St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day just doesn't happen. We, we need to get in, you know, partying and drinking shape. So if you could leave a couple of tunies in there to help us make sure that we're on that'd our game awesome. for the podcast, that'd be rocking. All right. And let's see what else do we have because democracy is something that you do write those letters, but also, you know, if you have somebody in your life, it doesn't necessarily have to be your child, but if you have a niece, for example, or a cousin, because who's into sports, make a point to go see one of their games. If you can, if your, if your schedule permits, yeah, try and, try and make it happen. 
At some point, I know it's not always easy. One of the reasons I left hockey after two years was just because I kept on standing on street corners at 5.30, 6.30 in the morning waiting for somebody else's family to come and pick me up like this. Mm-hmm. You know, we were five boys in the foster home, but my foster parents never came to see a game until you know, the last game of the last year when we were in the finals. So, and that's like, well, nobody's coming to see me. So what's the point? Yeah. And I kind of gave it up. So, you know, whatever level they're competing at, the kids are putting in a lot of effort and a lot of work. Well, and, and, and something yeah, that... a lot of heart. So encourage them by showing up. Well, that'll, that'll lead into my words of wisdom today, which are, you know... Something I've learned by uh, observation, because it was observation that taught me this, was that um, kids don't want much from you. They just want to spend time with you. And I didn't realize how uh, realistic that was until I saw an episode of Ted Lasso, and that was explained in the episode. And then my family member explained to me about how they, they... they had a, a relative come and stay with them for about a week, and they took the relative uh, you know, to Wonderland and here, there, and everywhere, and... and then went on a bike ride the last night before they went to go home the next day and said, you know, we did this, this, what was your favorite thing? And the response was the bike ride. So they did, you know, took this person to all these different unique places, spent a ton of money on this person doing all these things that you think the kid's going to like. And it turned out what the kid liked the most was just spending time with them. So take that under advisement. Kids just want your time, man. They don't, you don't need to spend stuff. You don't need to buy them things, you know, trinkets, bobs, gifts that, that sure, that's nice, but they just want your time. That's all kids really want. They want you to be interested in them and they want to Mm -hmm. make you proud. Yes. Yeah. But even like if you're a grown up, you know, men, you know, your wife's, Mm -hmm. if they're playing some type of sport, you're an adult, go watch their curling game one night, go watch them play, play tennis one day. Mm -hmm. And so like just like sit there and cheer for them because you it really means a lot like you know, my beaver sweetie comes and watches a couple of curling matches a year for me like this and a couple of times in the season will come and watch me watch a tennis mat play a tennis match you know and it's just like again there are no cameras there's no cash prize there's no nothing mm-hmm. you've paid but when he's there. but when yeah but when he's there mm-hmm. i played just a little harder mm-hmm. and I right know want him to be proud me. I totally agree. I know you have to go, Paul, but I just want to say the best, some of the best parenting advice I had with kids in sports is just to say, just to be there and just to say, I'm just so, I'm just so happy to watch you play. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if you win or lose. And uh, it was just the best advice. Yep. Yep. It makes my heart happy to watch you play. Mm. All right. Mr. Grizzly, you gave us your words of wisdom. So I will say, Get some cubs. It can be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the rooster. I can do that. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. No specific Easter egg today, but I also, because I forgot to mention it, um, to all the women who uh, tune in to watch our show, this. Um, thank you so much because yeah. uh, you may not know it, uh, but when we look at our demographics data from the platforms that we can get them from, um, you'd be surprised because it's a political show and usually politics you associate with being like man's business. Um, our viewers is predominantly women mm-hmm. and our supporters, particularly those of you who actually go to the emergency hydration fund and leave something for us, the overwhelming majority 
are women. So this show, I guess in this initiative, in this endeavor, is what it is. Very much, we might be two guys that came up with the idea and are doing the show, but it's going places and it's going to the places it's going because principally, overwhelmingly, the support of the women who come in on the chat and who make donations and support. So we literally would be nothing without you. Our founding sponsors are all businesses that have women in key roles or that are owned and operated by women or co-owned and operated by women. Um, we love you. We would not be where we are without you. We would not be who we are without you. Um, you're loved. You're appreciated. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. May you have a really kick-ass day. And why is it only a day? Yeah. Really? I mean, really? I mean, really? Yeah. Can't let the MGTOWs get too excited, I guess. <laughs> They're excited anyway. Yeah, you're right. <sighs> but yes. Ladies. We salute you. We salute you. All right. I'll see okay. you. Have a great weekend.